<clears throat> We're live. Welcome everybody to this, our third session today of uh, IP Scrutiny. Um, a welcome to you all, officers and members, uh, and it gives me great pleasure to hand over to John to chair this session. John, good afternoon. Okay, thank you all. Well, welcome. Um, I'm proposing uh, to, with, with this um, education libraries and lifelong learning session to move straight into questions as we have quite a lot to get through. So if I hand over Chris, uh, to Chris Lloyd to ask our first question, thank you. OK, no problem. The first question, I assume you want the libraries one rather than my, or do you want my yes, question please. at the end? Yes, yep. go straight okay. to, to the libraries, please. Right. What, what are the opportunities and challenges faced by libraries in achieving their increased income target? Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, members of the committee for having me today. Um, so the current library's target is uh, £1 million per annum, which is around 10% of the overall operating budget. So it's already challenging. Uh, in 25-26, that's set to increase by £100,000. Um, in setting fees and charges, the aim is to strike a balance between a reasonable amount, for example, for overdue books or for photocopying, printing, room hire, etc., um, but also ensuring that we are not deterring users from accessing a library or accessing the services that it provides. Um, therefore, if we bring in large increases in fees and charges, it can be counterproductive and can drive users away. So where, where we're able to be more co commercially focused um, with income opportunities, we are exploring those, um, such as renting out space to um, pop-up banks, etc. We just had that recently um, with Barclays in a few of our libraries. Um, but over the last few years, the libraries have been very successful in generating income um, and have broadly achieved the £1 million per year target. Uh, new opportunities for generating income are always welcome and will be explored, uh, but they can be limited and they also need to be deliverable without incurring further costs, which cannot be recouped. Thank you. OK, thank you. Chris, do you want to put, go with yep. the second, um, the second yep. question? Then we'll we'll yep. open it up to follow-ups. Yep, certainly. The pa papers um, indicate, Caroline, that a new historic archive facility will be deferred again until 26-27. Can we be assured that the scheme will start then? And if not, what impact is it having on our existing records? And are we at risk of destroying any of these important records by not having sufficient space? Uh, th thank you very much, Chris. Um, so we're not talking about a new library here. We're actually talking about the um, archive centre. Uh, Absol absolutely, yes. Yeah, yeah, with okay. the local studies library being part of that service. Um, so it's not being deferred. Work is continuing apace to find a solution um, to the need for more archive space and improved facilities, which will take time. Um, we are certainly hopeful that within the next two to four months, we'll have a firm uh, project and a proposal to address the pressures on our archiving space. But in the meantime, there's no impact on the current services. Uh, we're continuing to operate as normal um, and we can continue to do so for a few more years before space becomes more of a critical issue. Um, with regards to are we at risk of destroying important historical records? Um, the very short answer is no, not even a, a remote risk. We would um, continue to operate an accredited archive service that preserves and safeguards important historical documents for the public to access. And even after we um, are in the process of digitising these documents, uh, we, are, we still won't be destroying them. So absolutely um, no risk of that whatsoever. Thank you very much. Okay, Chairman. Thank you. Chairman, can I come back briefly on Please the do. first do, question? Question. and it may be, Caroline, you need to give a written answer because I'm conscious of time, but I, I'm still concerned with the targets on the libraries, what impact that's going to have. And my supplementary would be, which isn't financial, what can we as members, and that's not just those of us here, do to ensure that libraries are seen as really, really important hubs. And it's more than just for books. It, you know, people come in and they read the, they read the newspapers, they borrow other things, they get information. So I think they're the front door for the county council into our communities. And there may well be other opportunities and hence the libraries may be able to get some money out of other parts of the county council because I think it's really strategic. 
um and i'm fortunate to have a, a newish library because the okay. old one burnt down before you were a county councillor sorry i waffled chairman okay, thanks chris. yeah chris can i just can i just invite no chris can i just invite that one off to go offline um perfectly valid but it's not really not really budgetary if i could just ask you to take that yep. up in due course offline thank we you we can discuss it off, off, offline chris i do agree with you and we're doing lots, lots in that in that aspect so we'll take it offline thank you okay thank you i, I see mark has his hand up if you'd like to it's a very quick one, actually, Caroline, you, about Howells, uh, and we're looking to relocate out of the county hall building. Is there any risk that uh, Howells will, you know, be inconvenienced by this? Will, you know, will Howells be moved out in before we get to the the, the fact that, that building will be vacated? Uh, well, I, our priority is to make sure it, we have an accredited service and a highly respected service. So our priority is to make sure that members of the public are able to access our historical records. Um, and we certainly don't want to put any of that service at, at risk. Uh, so that's being taken into account, as I stated before, hopefully within the next two to four months, uh, we should have a firmed up proposal um, of exactly what's going to happen. But at this present moment in time, house can accommodate um, the records. Uh, in a few years, we will get to the point where, uh, sorry, I think Simon, one of my officers wants to come in, um, where we might run out of space, but at this present moment in time, those those, those records are being well looked after. Uh, Simon, did you want to come in? It was um, only really very... We're, we're running over time, so it, could you just make it as quick as you can, please? I will indeed. Just as just a response to Mark, if and when we did have to move, Mark, of course, it is way more complicated than calling Pickfords to come and move. So if we were relocating, it's likely we would see the service closed or limited service for perhaps up to a number of months. So when all the materials packed, ready for moving. So it's not an easy thing if we do move. But as Caroline said, we would keep the service going. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, everyone. I'm uh, moving us on now to the on next questions on the SEND priority action plan. Jan Madden, would you be good enough to ask the question? Thank you. Uh, yes. What will be the impact of the investment required by the SEND priority action plan and the revised improvement plan? And what will be the measures of success? Uh, Thank, thank, you, thank you very much, Jan. Um, yeah, so the making uh, send everybody's business investment, uh, which is the five million that was agreed by Cabinet in July 2023, um, along with, as you'll see in the IP papers, an additional two million pounds um, are pivotal to the successful improvement of outcomes for children and young people with special educational needs and disabilities and those missing education or suffering inclusion. So the investment is going to be used to improve educational health and care plan time, timeliness and quality, um, thus enabling improved outcomes for children and young people and providing improved experiences for parents and carers in relation to the EHCP statutory process. Um, this will also enable greater support for schools in ensuring that children are attending school reducing the number of part-time timetables um, and reintegrating those missing from education. Um, directly related to areas for improvement which have been identified by the Ofsted and CQC in the Hertfordshire lo Local Area Send Inspection, um, as part of the um, programme and part of the investment, we're going to be recruiting 80 new frontline staff into services across the Inclusion and Skills Directorate to help us deliver statutory SEND services. Uh, we received over 700 applications um, and 70 new appointments have been made. In fact, I met with the first cohort of 12 um, at the beginning of January, so they're all ready to go. Very exciting times for us. Um, EHCPs of school aged children will be delivered by a dedicated school aged team and some EHCPs will be managed by EHC coordinators who will sit in teams across children's services, for example, early years, services for young people, virtual school. Um, this means that they're going to have access to the most tailored expertise where required. We're going to be implementing a workforce strategy to improve job satisfaction, retain new and existing staff through a new Hertfordshire SEND Academy. This is what I was mentioning before, uh, which offers a high quality induction and ongoing training and support. Um, so this launched on the 8th of January with the 17 recruits with additional cohorts due to start um, in the academy. And this is not just for new staff, but we're offering that training to existing staff. So should they wish to, they can also upskill at the same time. Um, creating a new SEND quality assurance team to focus on improving the quality of EHCPs, working with partners across education, health and social care to undertake multi-agency auditing, training, 
and learning events. Now, when it comes to the outcomes that we intend to achieve, um, we are looking for improvements in the quality of EHCPs, an increase in the number of new and amended EHC plans audited as good or better from cu the current baseline of 14% of plans to 40% of plans um, as nationally be uh, benchmarked by Envision 360. We're looking to improve the timeliness of new HCPs to 60% within 20 weeks of a baseline of 33% in 2022 and above the national and statistical neighbour average. We're looking to improve timelines of annual review from 9% in July 2023 to 40% by April 2025. Um, we are looking for improvement in parent care experience of statutory processes as measured by an increase in complements into the service by April 2025 by 20% from 207 complements in 2022-2023. Um, and increase staff knowledge, skills and satisfaction measured through staff survey feedback, retention rates of statutory SEND staff and an increase in staff achieving accredited qualifications. Some of the most recent investment will focus on the exclusion landscape specifically and not into statutory send. The virtual school and access and inclusion services will enable them to effectively undertake statutory duties in relation to attendance and school inclusions. The outcomes that we are aiming to achieve are that children and young people with SEN who are at risk of inclusion, poor attendance, missing education or on part-time timetables will receive more support with their education and a reduction in the number of, um, of, um, of children with EHCPs on part-time timetables. There'll be focused support for vulnerable young people by 50% from the baseline of 367 in September 2023 by April 2025. Sorry, I know I'm rattling through a lot of information, but you said that you're very strict with your timelines. Um, thank okay. you. Thank you, Carol. That was very comprehensive. Any follow-up questions from anyone? No, no follow ups. Uh, Jeff Jones. Uh, thanks, Chairman. Uh, yeah, thanks for that, Caroline. Just interested with the uh, the Hertfordshire Send Academy you mentioned. Um, can you give any uh, elaborate on that a little bit more? Um, where would that be located? I assume it would be within one of our uh, education establishments. And um, yeah. is there a budget line for that? Uh, yes, yeah, so um, they, it's, they started at Robertson House and it, it's basically a 12 week course where the new cohort are going to be working, um, being trained, but also working with existing staff, taking the time in the beginning to get to know each other so that they can understand the skill sets that they have and the skill sets that they're able to lend to other people, um, working on this accreditation over the 12 weeks so that by 12 weeks in, they should start to be able to uh, take on cases, but they will have spent some time actually in the departments working alongside uh, our current staff um, and with regards to the cost this is all coming under the uh, make send everybody's business so this is incorporated yeah. into the what was the existing five million pound um, investment per annum into the service the additional two million um, which will incorporate the, eight, the 80 new posts of which we have filled 70 and 12 already in uh, sorry 17 are already in training I can see Joe nodding, so I think I'm correct. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, Thanks, Mark. Caroline. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you very much, Mark. Mark, you have your hand up. Quick question. You're on mute, Mark. Sorry about that. Am I off mute? I am now. Good. Yeah. Okay. You're fine. I understand you. the interim targets that have been put into the response of the improving the quality of the HCPs, but what are you ultimately looking to achieve? And I, yeah. I mean, I'm just wondering where you think this could go to because. So at the moment, I think it's, it's, it's in the right direction, but I don't feel parents are still 40% would not be getting their EHCPs done in a timely fashion and, um, you know, the, the, the quality needs to be better. So I just wondered what the ultimate and how long it would take. And I know we're putting more people into that and maybe Hero can come in with some answers on where we're aiming to get to. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the aim from the beginning has been uh, to be able to um, improve both the quality and the timeliness, which you'll be very aware of, of, of the EHCPs. Um, 
and also to ensure that the actual caseloads that each member of staff are dealing with was lowered because at one stage it was kind of near the four to 500, now it's nearer the 200. So obviously we want to be able to reduce that so that as well as people receiving better EHCPs, our staff aren't under so much pressure where they're dealing with a high number of cases. Uh, where do we want to get to? Ultimately, the answer, I would say, isn't really a budgetary one. It's actually... Um, uh, regaining the trust of the parents uh, in the county, uh, the parents and the carers who have children with special educational needs and disabilities who felt that the system has been slow, um, the system has let them down, the communication hasn't been good enough. When we get to the point where we are getting, I suppose I touched on it at the end of what I'm saying, where we are getting uh, compliments, we're getting satisfaction levels and people are feeling as though they're not having to, to fight for, uh, you know, the best outcomes for their children and we're delivering better outcomes for their children. That's really where, where we want to be. We'll hopefully see those numbers, you know, the numbers of compliments rising, uh, the um, amount of time it takes to get an EHCP um, shortening and all of those numbers will hopefully align until we get to a point where people are feeling satisfied and we feel we're delivering a good service. Hope that answers your question. I think it does, except how I think your staff workloads are slightly optimistic. Sorry, I don't think they're 200 yet. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, John, your mute is. how that happened. Uh, can, Jan Madden, do you have a question? Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, thank you. I, I said I didn't want to follow up, but um, the, the reason simply because Caroline had answered all the follow up things that I wanted to, to bring up. But actually, she ran through them at 100 miles an hour. And I just wonder if we can have a um, sort of a, a, a printed uh, timetable of those expectations. That would be really helpful. Thank you. OK, thank you. H Hero, is there anything that you can say very quickly or is it best to put you I'll be incredibly I'll be incredibly brief chair thank you uh, just to say the timetable is really clearly outlined in the improvement plan it's got the milestones and timelines there so we can send that to you Jan um, as reference but that public record the other bit just to come back if I may on Councillor Watkins point around quality and getting up to 40 percent and I met with a range of head teachers this week on this not just on this matter but on, on other matters and and they actually welcome the realism um, about these targets within the, um, the time frame that we have, given where the baseline is. They feel that we know what the problem is and we're doing what we need to to address that. But you're right, it's going to take longer to do that in a more periodic um, sort of consistent sorry, way um, over, a, over a period of time. Our full reinspection will be within three years of the previous inspection. So this is working towards our monitoring visit, which will be in early 25, but the full reinspection will be in July 26. So we will set new timelines in early 25, providing we've achieved those, which we hope to certainly exceed, you know, exceed sort of 60% and so on from there, providing progress has gone in the right direction yeah. and the numbers of EHCPs have gone in the right direction. I think it's important to also note your point around uh, caseloads. The current situation is that staff are still managing incredibly high caseloads because we're taking staff into the SEND Academy right now. So they will come online from April, May time onwards. So that's when that reduction and therefore the improvements will be seen. Okay. Thank you, Thank Jeff. you, Okay, Thank shall you. we move on now? Okay. Thank you very much, everyone, for those questions and answers. Let's move on now to high needs. Uh, Mark, Mark Watkin, would you be good enough to ask the questions? Just try, oh, there, I'm now unmuted, right. Um, what has been built into the medium long-term plan to mitigate the risk of the £15 million deficit in the Direct Schools Grant uh, Fund? That's the first question. There's about four of them, actually. So I don't know if you can answer the DSG question. And you're on you're mute. On mute. Hmm. Sorry, do you want to do all four of them and I'll answer all four of them? Okay, yeah, they're, they're quite lengthy. So if you... Oh, That's fine. Right. If the deficit cannot be mitigated, what would be the impact on services and schools for children with SEND if the funding doesn't increase with inflation? 
will there be a lot uh, <coughs> pardon me a loss of staff or other services inside schools as a result of that is will the high needs budget deficit result in changes to the criteria to access the funds so for example will we change the the banding that, that, that will make available for children uh, in terms of the level of support they get um, and could there be a change uh, I, think I just mentioned that one and what would be the impact of capping funding for schools with this proportionate large numbers of children with EHCPs, will there be a threat to special educational needs schools? Okay, um, thank you, thank you very much. Um, so um, at corporate level, reserves um, of 20 million are, are notionally set against this deficit. But the, the first question you've asked is, is actually one for uh, corporate finance. Um, but with regards to, it's, it's, it's not one for me, it's one for corporate finance. But with regards to um, the mitigation, that's going to be our standard improvement strategy. Um, in the longer term, we're hoping that's going to limit the um, rate of, of, of growth of expenditure. Um, with regards to the deficit, uh, this really depends on whether the council is able to continue um, with the current policy of operating a deficit on the um, high level needs uh, dedicated school grant and rolling that deficit over from year to year. We can't really answer a hypothetical when we don't know what the size of the shortfall is going to be. Um, with regards to the um, changes to, to the criteria, the, the budget for 2025 does not provide enough funding to uplift each funding band in line with um, future increased staffing costs. So, you know, circa 7% for teaching assistance. We're consulting with schools at the moment on whether to address this issue by changing the relative funding for each band or by not increasing each band in line with staffing cost inflation. Um, and with regards to your last question, we will be changing the mechanism by which schools um, with disproportionately large numbers of children with EHCPs receive additional funding. The current budget for this isn't sufficient to continue with the current mechanism um, due to the impact of growing numbers of pupils with the EHCPs on eligibility. So we're currently consulting schools on this. Some schools will receive less than in the past and many um, less than would have been the case had we kept the mechanism the same. Um, but just to make it clear, that will not um, affect special schools and it won't necessarily impact what a school provides, but it will impact schools' own budgets and own resources potentially. Um, so I hope that answers it. Sorry, I saw somebody's hand up, but I... Okay, thank you. I think, I think just, Stephen and... Well, can I just okay. one supplementary, and it will only be quick. Um, you, you, you said that the, the projection for Heinie's funding wasn't very clear. I think from Schools Forum, the direction is massively towards 61 million, and I think in the next two years, um, overspend against the income. So um, I just really wanted to stress that that is going to have a major impact if the council feel or is required to um, fund. Yeah, the, the difference if it goes back to um, our budget reserves and Stephen Pillsworth coming in to comment on that. Yeah. Yeah, Stephen, can you comment? Yeah, that, thanks everyone. I hope, hope you don't mind me chipping in. So Stephen Pillsworth, di Director of the Finance uh, here at HCC and the Corporate Finance Lead, as Caroline mentioned. So, so just on this one, in turn, from my perspective, it's not just the position next year, it's the position the year after that and the year after that, because if demand increases as we expect it to do and outstrips the available increases in funding, then that deficit widens each year and the accumulated deficit grows. Uh, and you may have seen from the budget papers and all the reports Cabinet and uh, Forum have considered, you know, on current forecasts, that could reach £60 million in a number of years' years time. Um, now, of course, we're not alone in that. Uh, up here, council is in a similar position, but I have had to take that into account in terms of my overall view on the council's financial position. And as you heard uh, Caroline say, I have felt the need for the council to set aside some level of reserves in case there is a scenario in the future, as we have seen with some other councils, where the council needs to contribute to that. So clearly, absolutely the right thing to do in terms of provision for, for children, but it does have those wider financial implications and destabilise you know, the wider finances of the, the council, hence my recommendations to council on that reserve provision. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank, OK, thank you very much. Uh, Stephen, Simon, did you want to comment as well? Yeah, I, I was just going to say, I mean, obviously it's been a it's been a very difficult budget decision about how to manage the, the high needs budget for the council. Um, and 
agreeing to go into deficit to the tune of 17 million is a pretty substantial commitment to the quality of services for, for children with SEND. Um, and when we um, advised members, reached a view that we needed to go 17 million into deficit, that, that, that balance was kind of struck uh, so as to avoid the quality of services for children with special educational needs being damaged. So that's, that's a kind of important reassurance point to make. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that um, resources for schools and other providers are not going to be squeezed. We know that uh, you know, schools will not get the money that they would like to have done. But we do think the amount we've allocated um, is, is sufficient to keep the quality of service. And our, uh, you know, the, the budget decision for future years will be the extent to which we continue that policy. Um, I mean, it, it will be difficult for schools, but we are reasonably confident in their ability to deliver quality. And there are two pieces of evidence for that. Um, one is that, you know, we continue to get very positive Austin outcomes um, for our mainstream schools and for our special schools. And indeed, all 19 of our maintained special schools are good or outstanding in Ofsted terms. Um, and we know that in the area SEND inspection, um, that by and large, parents were quite happy with the quality of the provision that they got in school once they were in the school that they wanted to go to. So, you know, it will be difficult for parents. Um, uh, sorry, it will be difficult for schools. Um, we think the council's carrying a, a big share of the burden by going into deficit. It will be difficult for schools, but we think that for pupils, um, the outcomes will be uh, secure. Okay, thank you, Simon. Any other follow-up questions? I'm not seeing any. Mark, you're happy if we can move on then? Uh, yeah, to, it's, fine. Um, it's fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, mainstream school section then, uh, please. Uh, Cheryl Hunter, Cheryl Hunter, if you wouldn't mind asking the question. Yeah, some of this um, has been covered, but um, given the inflation cost issues and the changes to the national funding formula, what work is being carried out with schools to reduce costs whilst maintaining the breadth of the curriculum and standards? Uh, yeah, th thank you for your question. Um, we are doing a lot of work with our schools, actually. Uh, we offer advice and support on um, financial management. Uh, that's provided to all of our maintained schools by Hearts for Learning on our behalf. Uh, we're helpful. We are also intervening with schools um, to support them in their budget management. Um, and Hearts for Learning provides um, schools with advice on budget, man budget management. Um, and in some circumstances, they can even deploy staff uh, to help maximise benefit. Um, and for those of you who don't know, they provide a huge array of services, good quality and competitive pricing um, to support schools, including energy, uh, catering, uh, supplies, lots of services, all great value for money, um, and most of the time better value for money than external um, suppliers. Um, so we really um, work very closely with our schools through Hearts for Learning to try and support them wherever possible. Thank you. Okay, there's a second part of the question, so I'll just um, say that if schools move into a deficit, what will be the impact on the county council's finances? Um, so as soon as um, schools start to move um, uh, towards a deficit, we up the level of support here from Hertfordshire County Council. Uh, when maintained schools move into budget deficit, um, they are required to develop a three year recovery plan. Uh, we work with them and support them with this. In certain circumstances, some deficits are written off. Um, for example, in the case of a mandatory um, academy conversion, we carefully track all schools' positions um, or intervene early before those deficits become unmanageable. Um, in three cases, um, we've had to close um, or propose closure of schools that have become unsustainable. Um, and to date, there has been no impact um, on our council's finances. Um, but the financial positions of academies does not directly affect us, uh, but it does indirectly. So, yeah, we effectively up the level of support to schools. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Uh, Simon, your hand is up. Is that still from the, the previous question or do you have something to comment no, it's still on from the previous question. Apologies. All right. Okay. That. Thank you. Okay. Are we all, thank you for those questions and answers. Are we ready to move on? Okay. Let's move on to homeschool transport. Uh, so Jan, Jan Cameron, would you be good enough to Ask the questions we have. For yep, those. I have three questions. The first one is: uh, What efficiency savings will be made in the provision to home to school transport, which I mentioned in the which you mentioned in the document? 
Uh, second one, how will changes to personal transport budgets help? And lastly, will there be changes to the criteria to access the transport such that pupils who would previously have qualified will no longer qualify? OK, uh, thank, thank you for your question. Um, yeah, so with regards to efficiency savings, we are extending our use of uh, Q-Routes, um, which is a planning software where contracts are retendered. It also, um, it's it's very clever. It kind of maps out exactly what children are going to school where um, and how to get them there um, more effectively. Um, so that will yield some savings. We're also um, continue, continuing to vigorously promote our personal transport budgets um, and try and support families wherever possible into moving towards them. Um, changes to personal tra transport budgets um, will help because each uh, PTB saves on average five and a half thousand pounds uh, per child uh, compared to uh, contracted uh, transport. And as we're getting more take up that and as we are promoting and encouraging that, that that is rising year on year, the amount of people on uh, personal transport budgets. Um, and just your last question, will there be changes to the criteria? Um, no, no proposed changes. Very, very simple answer. Not at this stage, no. Hope Thank, that you. Helps. Thank you. Thank you. Any follow up questions? I'm not seeing any hands raised. Uh, Jeff Jones. Uh, yes, thanks for that, Karen. Uh, uh, regarding the personal travel budgets, I mean, I think that is a really good initiative um, and could bring in some uh, savings to to the council. Um, what, what what sort of uptake? Has it has it been a really good uptake on that, or is it something that people are still a bit wary of? Uh, well, it's something that we're actively promoting because um, as well as the saving to the council, actually what, what, what it does is it really promotes independence um, in our pupils and wherever possible, we're trying to kind of promote independent travel. It's a really, you know, great, great life skill. Um, yeah. I know that we have a number of um, members of staff in Hertfordshire, I think more than uh, any of our neighbouring authorities um, where we've actually got um, transport, I forget the name of them actually, Hero or Simon, you might be able to help me out, um, uh, people who specifically work with children to to, to get them independently, trans travel trainers, thank you very much Joe. Uh, travel trainers. Uh, with regards to where the numbers are at the moment, I might actually just defer to Simon, you might have a, the most up-to-date figures of those. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Simon? Yeah, I mean, it, it, I think you're right. You're right, Jeff, that, um, you know, there has been hesitancy on the part of parents in, in taking up personal travel budgets. Um, but we are making, I think, quite good ground on that. So in the last mm -hmm. year, from October 22 to October 23, um, we, we increased the number of PTBs by around and about 150. Um, and the saving as a result of that, compared with contracted transport, was... Uh, you know, just a little bit short of short of a million pounds. So it's clearly a very important priority for us. Um, but we do think there's there's more room to go. I mean, mm. Caroline, there's, there's a number of things we're doing to support that. And Caroline's referenced the travel trainers, whereas, as she said, we think we have more than actually more travel trainers working with young people than any other local authority. Um, but we're also increasing our, our kind of staffing um, of individuals who can work directly with families who have very high cost transport travel arrangements to try to explore with them alternative alternative means of uh, of getting their children to school that may save us money and provide a better quality of service for the child um, and suit them. So we're, we're uh, resourcing, tailoring support to what you might call the high cost families um, and we've also invest, invested in a um, an application called Home Run, um, which mm -hmm. is a kind of uh, it, it's a sort of lift sharing application. Essentially, it allows parents to register um, their desire to go from their home to such and such a school and to be put in contact with other parents mm. who may have similar route preferences so that they can arrange route sharing. And we've been. We rolled that out originally partly as an, an environmental sustainability <coughs> initiative in a local area, but we're looking to generalise that across the special schools community um, so as to make it easier for parents to um, to take advantage of the PT, PTB offer. And of course, um, you know, last year we also increased the PTB rate from 45p a mile to 55p a mile, 
and that yeah. I think has contributed. So um, we're certainly encouraging everybody uh, to try to spread the message about the benefits um, of of what we're now offering. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and, you it, and just just uh, uh, carrying on from that, John, just I mean, very briefly. Um, and it, it, is that sort of promoted, obviously, within the schools, I assume, as well as um, uh, through the county, the schools promote these schemes like like the, the home run? Yeah, the home the home run is something that requires the engagement of each of the schools. You know, we're, not all schools are signed up to it at the moment. We haven't rolled it out completely. As we do um, sign, as we as schools do sign up to it, then they provide information for their parents, and and the whole thing is set up so that you know yeah. parents are secure in the. Uh, it, it's not open to the wider public. It's, it's no. It's specific to the school communities that we're trying to support. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Good good questions, good answers. Thank you for that. Any other questions on transport? Okay, are we ready to move on then to services for young people? Uh, Jeff Jones again, could you ask your question, please? I will indeed. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, services for young people. Um, what could be the impact on young people if the funding for services for young people is reduced? And how would how would this be mitigated? Yeah, thank, thanks, Jeff. I mean, you'll, you'll be aware of the closure of the um, six young people centres because one of them is in uh, is in Eelpatch Bundingford. That's uh, indeed. Royston, Rickmans, Worth, St Albans, Hatfield, and Bundingford. Um, I mean, yeah, there's going to be less access in local communities for um, youth workers um, and associated support. And yes, there's going to be less places for young people to go and benefit from personal and social educational group work programmes. There will be a reduction in the capacity to deliver the traded. One-to-one uh, -one group work programs in schools, um, and less work projects in every district and borough, or capacity to take referrals from parents and carers, um, and a 25% reduction in the um, Hertfordshire Happy offer. Um, but what we have done to mitigate this um, is really try to focus on the areas that matter and focus on the young people who are likely to be uh, the most vulnerable. Um, so the service is going to be delivering a consistent term time offer of youth work projects in each of the 10 districts. Um, and we're going to be prioritising our work in line with the following five themes, which are working with the most vulnerable young people in the community, including those with special educational needs and disabilities. Um, school inclusion, which is going to include uh, children missing from education and children absent from education. Working with young people who are not in um, uh, education, employment or training to achieve um, a sustained EET outcome. A traded offer to schools and colleges primarily um, of CEIAG, personal development youth work and work related learning um, and support, coordination, promotion and development of the voluntary youth sector. Um, so we are hoping by really focusing on those people who need um, these youth services the most that will be mitigating um, the effects felt by um, any efficiencies that might be made in the service. Thank you. If I can just come back on that, John. Um, Paul, please do, Jeff. Yeah. Yeah, I know, Karen. You, you know, um, obviously, um, we've got we've got a, a youth centre in Bundyford in my division that's closing. So I don't want to be parochial, but I I, I just hope that um, the service is looking at alternative um, facilities. Because um, I believe in Bundyford's case, it was it was the fact that the the building itself um, wasn't, if you like, up to scratch. So um, is 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 there work being done looking at alternative locations rather than total closure of the service in a particular area? Yeah, well, th thank you for your question. I mean, part of the uh, piece of work was looking at the buildings because we had lots of buildings within the service that weren't necessarily fit for purpose. Um, they yeah. were older buildings. They weren't necessarily in the right location. Um, so, so as I kind of specified, I'm happy to, to take this, the rest of this offline with you. Sure. Um, we will ensure that services are, are available in, in each and every one of our 10 districts so that any child who needs to access these youth services is able to. Um, and we will also make sure whatever happens that those services are tailored to the children who need them, you know, who need them the most, you know, send um, 
you know children who who are not going to school uh, but I think the most important thing because you're asking specifically about the location is to make sure that each of the districts um, has this has has a facility or has access to youth services which um, I mean just just to kind of put it into context there are lots of local authorities across the country that don't don't have youth services at all mm. um, actually so um, you know we are we are doing everything we can at Hertfordshire to make sure that we are you know retaining the youth services for people who need them the most so yeah. I hope that helps. Yeah it, do, it does thank you but uh, I, I would say um, we should be we should be looking at alternative provision not just in districts but in the actually the, the towns where they're located because uh, obviously um, the users would have to travel quite a distance within that district so hopefully they'll be looking within the towns that, that they're located in closing for an alternative yeah. provision yeah i think okay, the offices you, will be looking to make sure that those services are are accessible in one way yeah. or another for each town i think here yeah. everyone wants to come in yeah, just, just to provide some reassurance for those most vulnerable groups that um, Councillor Capper outlined, um, we will be looking at alternative settings, as you say, so more YouTube work happening within school settings. It does happen within school settings now, but actually to re-engage young people and enable them to attend for more time. So it won't be just that youth work is happening in youth centres only. And that's sort of our methodology around that. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Okay. Chris Lloyd, do you have a question? Yeah, I do. I think Hero's partly answered it because I think schools, particularly secondary schools, is the place where we're going to need to do it. But I also echo Jeff's point. You can't just have one location within a district, you know, within three rivers. You've got people in South Oxy, you've got people in Malem. But if we're making use of the schools, I think we can still provide the service and make some form of saving. I know Mark's got a question, so I'll take my hand down. But yeah, thank you, Hero, for your answer of my question before I asked it. Thank you. Mark? I can't hear you, Mark. You're on mute, Mark. Um, yes, I, I know this is not so much budgetary, but it could have an impact on the authority. Have we assessed the potential, I suppose you could say, it's harm to young people? I'm thinking particularly about the reduction in happy um, activities in the in the summer holidays. This has actually been a way where children have been able to be looked after, nurtured, um, and indeed fed through free school meals. And so it could have quite a significant impact on, on to, like antisocial behaviour and things. Have we looked into the possible impacts of that? And again, if it's not actually budgetary, I'm happy to take an offline response on that one. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, sorry, 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 sorry. There's, there's, there's an echo. echo. You hear that? OK, um, yeah, I mean, just to say it's a really difficult one to quantify. I know this is something that the office is looking to into frequently, kind of the effects of uh, prevention and then the long term effects of what ends up being the outcomes. Uh, I know they do that all the way from early years. They're constantly looking at what they think the effect is going to be. So um, it's it's a bit of a complicated one. I know some work has been done. It's not a very easy uh, question to answer and certainly not in the next few minutes. So perhaps, uh, Hero, we can have a discussion with Mark about this offline because it, it, it is an interesting one and I'm sure there will be an impact, um, but not necessarily, not necessarily one that we can answer right at this moment in time. Yeah, and just, just to add to that, I, I happily take the question um, offline, but we absolutely did try and look at it in terms of given the context of reduction and so that we we had to make the least kind of the, the least impact on our young people and focusing on on our most vulnerable young people to make sure it's not impacting them um in particular but as uh, councillor Gapper said happy to take that offline okay thank you very much uh, joe fisher you have your very hand briefly up. just just to add to hero's point but i'll be very brief um mark um just to provide some additional assurance um we have had to reduce services as you're aware but in doing so what we have done is redesigned and remodeled our services towards those most vulnerable children and we know that school exclusion or not attending school full time is a real risk factor influencing um, young people's exposure to risk outside of the family home, uh, which is why Hero, um, working with her team, has been really focused on making sure that our services for young people moving forward has that really sharp focus on school <clears throat> inclusion and working with children in and through schools, as well as continuing some of the wider outreach and youth work provision. 
Okay, thank you, Joe. Okay, thank you for some good questions and answers there. Any other follow-up questions? I'm not seeing any hands up. Shall we move on then to net zero? Uh, so Chris Lloyd, can I ask you to ask the question for that? Yeah, I think this is a huge question and we'll probably need to have something, Caroline, coming back to panel, but I'll ask my initial question and then I've got some follow up questions if we have time, Chairman. What are the plans for investing in schools to help them move towards net zero carbon? Because obviously we've got many schools that are actually probably should be being rebuilt. So I think we've got a really huge challenge. Yes, th th thanks, Chris. I know you're, you're passionate about this. Um, we have uh, helped a number of schools to develop their own uh, carbon management plans, um, and we've made and implemented uh, a number of external funding bids to help retrofit schools um, to move to net zero carbon, um, installing PV panels, etc. Um, just so you're also aware that the Department for Education now mandates that every single new school has to be built to net zero carbon. Um, and just to give you a few examples of the amazing amazing new schools that have been built in Hertfordshire that I visited. We've got uh, Buntingford first. Jeff, that's one of yours um, in Buntingford. It, it's been built completely to net zero carbon. Uh, it's amazing. Every classroom is uh, uh, north facing, solar panels on the roof, um, special windows. It's, it's, it's incredible. The Valley, uh, which is the, um, the, our new special school has been built, been built um, also to net zero carbon. The new Breakspear uh, Special School, uh, also the same. And we've got a new school that's going to be opening next year, a special school in Potter's Bar um, that will also be operating at net zero carbon. So we are ensuring that every single one of our new schools is built um, to those standards and working with our existing schools to do whatever we can to um, update, modernise and help them in their journey towards uh, net zero. Thank you, Caroline. Jeff, uh, sorry, Chris Lloyd, do you have another question? Yes, I do, because uh, I think maintenance is going to be quite key because you can put a school in which is meant to be net zero. But if the schools haven't got the budgets to maintain it, I think we'll have a problem. And obviously, there haven't been net zero schools around for that long. So I think we do need to actually track them and to ensure that they actually hit what they say on the tin. Having looked at some of the other schools, just, for, you know, there's an impact on roofs. So it's not as straightforward as many of us would like it to be. Um, and equally, well, I think our bigger challenge is, and this is for our finance guys whose cameras are off, we actually need to rebuild some of these schools. But I agree, we haven't got the money, so I'm not expecting an answer. It's a rhetorical question, but I think at some point at panel, we need to really look at it <clears throat> and what it actually means. Because I think for a lot of schools, they won't get rebuilt in the time that they'd like to be. Yes, so um, I mean, I I understand what you're saying. We have we have planned and scoped the kind of program that it would take um, to move all of our schools to net zero carbon um, should funding become available. But the cost is absolutely enormous. I mean, we would need central government funding for this. Um, and at some stage that could become available. And if it does become available, we would be first in the queue and very well prepared to be able to put in bids for all of our schools because we've already done all of the work uh, in the run up to be able to put those bids in. Um, it is possible that Department for Education will try and deliver these programmes um, for maintain schools. Um, but... I mean, you know, who knows what's going to happen in the future? Should these funds become available, we would we will definitely uh, put in for them. But to change every single one of our maintained schools to net zero carbon at this present moment in time, without government funding or DfE funding, would be probably a step too far, and it would make this IP process extremely complex for every single member who's looking at it. And Stephen okay. Pillsworth probably uh, right. pull his hair out. Thank you. Yes, yeah, Simon. You, sorry, you wanted to come in on that. Simon, do you have a comment? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was I was just going to comment, Chris, that you're you're quite right about the about the significance of what schools do themselves and the part and and you know the way in which building managers and building operators can influence or help us towards sustainability goals. So one of the things that we've put emphasis on is to develop um, partnership bodies and partnership relationships with our schools, both maintained and academies, to try to support them through advice and support um, and, and to promote to them all the uh, the great initiatives that colleagues in uh, you know, in in um, in relation to waste recycling and so on that other parts of the council are doing but um, you know 
we I think we reported to panel maybe 18 months ago, two years ago on what would it, what it would take to um, move all our schools to to net zero carbon in operation and the refurbishment that would be required. And of course, the sums of money are such that only central government can provide that. But um, I mean, we were very successful in our bids to um, the public sector decarbonisation fund a couple of years ago. Uh, and we used that money to pilot um, retrofitted a number of schools, which is a thing that's that's putting us in a good position for the future. And we also put in, um, I think, about 85 sets of solar panels in schools, um, which have um, saved a heck of a lot of money for those schools uh, in the, the, the last couple of years when electricity prices have shot up. OK, thank you, Simon. Any final comments or questions on net zero we have a we have thank you at all for your questions and answers you've all been very concise we have a mm -hmm. couple of minutes a couple of minutes perhaps for any wash up or final questions or comments that anybody would like to to bring up Ooh. no okay in that case i'm going to hand i'm oh, sorry chris lloyd yeah i don't need to ask it there was a question that mark's already asked on the music service as long as that answer Emma can be included in the report. I didn't want uh, officers to think that we didn't care about the music service. We do. It's really important. Mark's answer basically told me that the work that will happen will ensure that we can still provide quality music to our children in Hertfordshire. But I think I wanted officers to know that we do do care about that as well as all the other parts of what you're doing. So thank you. Thank you. And there was also a question on attendance, which we were we were asking for a written a written response to as well. So that would be great. Thank you. OK, well, if we're all done, then I'll hand back to David Andrews, if that's OK. Thank you all very much for your contributions. Yes, thank you very much, team. That's 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 amazing. Um, fabulous input from officers, for which I'm sure we're all very, very grateful. Um, John, thank you very much. Uh, we are looking okay. to see you back. Um, for the the uh, portfolio session uh, yours will be 3:30 to 3:45 so we're looking to see members back here um online at 3:30 but thank you so much for everybody's input that was amazing thank you yeah thanks very thank much thank you bye thank you, thank you. Bye. bye.
it's uh, 2015. We're about to go live, members. Thank you. I'll just give a 20 second uh, welcome, Richard, and then. Um, You're live, David. You. Hello, you welcome. Welcome to this, the, the fourth session today of uh, our IP budget scrutiny for, for 23, 24 and beyond. Sorry, 24, 25 and beyond. Uh, welcome to you all. Look forward to a good rollicking session. The others have all gone to time. No pressure there, Richard. Um, at which point I hand over to you to chair us through this, this afternoon's session. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Right, may may I start proceedings, uh, ladies and gentlemen, by asking the portfolio holder or the director, whoever wishes to give a brief introduction. You've got four minutes left. OK, thank you. Um, good afternoon, Chair, and uh, good afternoon, colleagues. I'm Councillor Fiona Thompson, the lead member for Children, Young People and Families, and I'm joined today by my deputy, Paula Hiscox, and um, officer colleagues who I was going to ask to introduce themselves, Chair, if that's OK, um, if maybe we could have four and a half minutes for that. Um, just to say that within Children's Services um, and along with um, children's services across the country. We've seen incredible incredible pressures this year, um, both from increased demand for services, increased complexity of need amongst the children and young people that we support, uh, along with um, shortage of independent placements and provider inflation. And within Hertfordshire, our priorities, and especially in our role as corporate parents, is we, we are ambitious for our children and young people. We, um, one of our corporate priorities is to give every child the best start in life. Um, we work very hard to keep children safe and to improve outcomes. So that's really the setting point. Our budget is the second largest in the County Council at around 257 million, which is not an insignificant amount of money to spend on children's services. Uh, thank you, Chair. Can I ask the officers, uh, starting with Joe, to quickly introduce themselves? Thank you. Yes, please, please do, please do. Good afternoon, I'm Joe Fisher. I'm the Executive Director for Children's Services in Hertfordshire. I'm delighted to be here this afternoon. Thank you. Uh, Miranda. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Miranda Gittos. I'm the Director of Specialist Services and Commissioning. And uh, Janet. Good afternoon. I'm Janet Jones, Interim Director for Children and Families. And uh, Paula. Oh, you're on mute, Paula. Yes, I was abiding by the rules. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm the Deputy Executive um, Member for Children's Services and work with Fiona. Thank you. And Rachel Adler, who I've just seen, is on the call. Thank you. Thanks, Fiona. I'm Rachel Adler, Director of Business Sport and Finance for Children's Services. And I'm looking at officers. Have I missed out anybody who needs to introduce themselves? No, I can see Joe shake your head. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you very much. Right. Uh, we now come to the main body of the meeting where the questions start. Um, I haven't seen Dee Hart online. Is she? Are, are you in the meeting, Dee? Possibly not. So We're trying right to call Dee in, Richard. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Graham. It's Theresa Baker here, Democratic Services, Hertfordshire County Council, 01992556545. Just to remind you that you're a member of the Children, Young People and Families. Um, oh. oh, yes. Right. Well, what we'll do, ladies and gentlemen, if I might, please, members, can I go on to the second uh, question? And this is the one scheduled for five minutes time. Uh, Jay Cameron. Um, you just before you do, Chairman, it's James Quilty here, um, County Councillor. Um, just to say that I had problems in finding the link for this particular event as well. So, so that maybe D has having issues, technology issues. Yeah. Th just okay, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you yeah. for that. We are flexible here. There's no earthly reason why we can't come back to her question when she yes. arrives and comes on. On. If not, I'll ask somebody else to ask it. But, uh, Jay Cameron, please. It doesn't look as if he's on the on the in, in attendance. He, he was with in, on the education group. Maybe he's dropped off somewhere. Perhaps he somebody might, else could ask the question. Richard, right, I, I, I can I can start off if you like uh, with these question. Yes, please. Will you will you do so? Thank you. Thank you. Um, for those watching, my name is Peter Head, and I'm a county councillor for Hatfield East, and I also sit on the uh, Children, Young People, and Families uh, Committee. Um, 
uh, first question we, we have is, are there plans to, enhan to enhance existing support systems to better meet the needs of young individuals with complex presentations? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to ask Jo to, to come in on that one um, for starters. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Fiona. Yes, we have a very strong uh, uh, service response for children and adolescents who are, have got complex presentations. So those who might be exposed to risk, including risk outside of the family home, um, and also those who might be presenting with uh, complex social emotional uh, difficulties. Back in 2020, we launched our specialist mm -hmm. Um, safeguarding Adolescent Service, uh, often uh, referred to as our SASH team. Um, and that's uh, a team of qualified uh, practitioners as well as alternative, uh, alternatively qualified practitioners who provide really intensive support to young people, uh, particularly about some of the risks they can be exposed to outside of the family home. So we often talk about contextual fate safeguarding, but things such as county line, those young people getting involved in uh, criminal justice system or um, at risk of uh, behaviour that might put themselves at risk as well as others. Um, we had that inspected back in uh, July 2021 and Ofsted told us at the time that we had a very strong service and it's a good partnership approach so we work very closely with the police, health colleagues, the voluntary sector um, as well as colleagues across children's services to make sure that children and young people are kept safe at home and in their communities. And that team has had a huge amount of success. So I think at any one, any one year, it works with around 1,100 children um, in their teenage years um, who have been identified as um, having a high level of need or being in, involved in risky behaviour. And the, the team are very successful in de-escalating the risk um, and keeping children home uh, say we've seen a reduced number of children being taken into our care who are in their teen years, um, year on year since the launch of the service. So a very high success rate in keeping children and young people home in their home, uh, safe at home and in their communities. And, and thank you. Thank you, Joe. And if I may add, around 70 percent of the children, and young people who are open to the SASH team have been prevented um, from becoming looked after children or reunified homes. So that just demonstrates the success, as Joe has outlined, and, and the strength of this particular team. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. Peter, are, you, are you or any other member require any further information on that particular? Or may I move on? Well, the, the, the natural question to ask for the, for the, uh, following that is, is cost. But I, I, I see that uh, Steve's got a question uh, re regarding that later. Fine. OK, thank you. In which case, can we go to the next question? Yeah. Um, again, Peter, yeah. can you just lead on that one for me, please? Okay. Uh, are there plans or strategies in place to address the shortage in placement market volume and respond to the complexity of young individuals? Yeah, so th thank you for the question. So this relates really to our, we have a very ambitious uh, residential strategy. As you know, um, when children come into our care and um, we are responsible for um, supporting them and meeting their needs, we have one of the lowest numbers of children in care across the, the country. I think we're 11th actually, um, with just under about um, 950, I think, in care, which is about half the national average. But clearly meeting children, young people's needs is critically important and children can be um, supported in a variety of um, different ways. So some will be with foster care, some will be with um, independent foster care agencies, in-house children's homes, which we have seven of, um, and external placements. And of course, we all know the independent placements are where we have no control over the cost, which is something um, is beginning to be looked at nationally, because clearly that's where one of the greatest financial pressures is. So we are within our residential strategy, we are looking to increase the number of our in-house children's residential home beds so that we can shift the balance, if you like. And, you know, we know it's better for children and young people majoritively to be supported close to home and to live close to home, close to their families. And that's a really important part of looking after them. Um, Miranda, would you like to come in here just to maybe just provide a little bit more detail? Thank you. Of course. Um, so um, 
uh, members will be aware that since 2019, we, we have had an ambitious residential strategy, um, and that was to develop 31 new beds. Uh, we've got four beds to go, so we anticipate we will have those four final beds delivered by the end of this year. So what we plan to do this year is start residential strategy two, which is an additional 22 beds, um, starting with two emergency beds that we finish off um, by the end of this year alongside the existing strategy beds and then we would seek to uh, open the further 20 beds by December 2027. And what we're looking at is a mixed economy of both in-house provision but also provision commissioned using Hertfordshire properties. Um, we're also looking to tailor provision to meet uh, complex needs and in particular we, you, you will probably all be aware that we in December we opened Cherry Tree Cottage which was a joint venue with our colleagues in health um, and that is for children who are either coming out being discharged from um, in hospital tier four mental health provision or at, or at risk of going into that provision um, so we're having discussions uh, with colleagues in health about opening another uh, cherry tree cottage we we feel that we need an orchard um, uh, so within that, so within, within those 22 beds, I've, I've just frozen, I hope you can hear me, within those 22 beds, we'll be looking to tailor provision specifically to meet children's needs. Uh, we're also looking uh, at our semi-independent accommodation and looking at how we can commission more smartly uh, using uh Again, Hertfordshire properties, but having smart contracts with providers like Hightown and One YMCA. So the general thrust of of all our um, strategies is to increase in house provision where we keep children in Hertfordshire, where we know we look after them better, and to reduce our reliance on the expensive independent sector. And also in addition to that, with our fostering strategy, uh, we will be trialling specialist foster carers. So we want to uh, trial six foster carers that are paid a reasonably high rate, uh, about £50,000 a year, equivalent to a, a, a salary, on the basis that they take children who would, with very high needs, who would otherwise be in residential settings. So again, that will increase our in-house provision and again, increase the support we're providing, particularly to children with very complex needs. Thank you, Miranda. And if I could just add, of course, this runs alongside our continuous work to reunify children with their families. So it's a multi-strand uh, approach, really. So it's about creating our own in-house provision. It's working with those independent, the independent sector. It's about increasing the number of foster carers and we have a very strong record and of um, supporting our foster carers in Hertfordshire and they like being with Hertfordshire um, and and then it's about yeah, you know monitoring um, the progression of uh, children's home beds that we can open and then that ties into our, the residential academy and so it's all interlinked really and of course just to say that within Hertfordshire all of our children's homes are good or outstanding so um, we're very proud of that and that's important for our children and young people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Peter you want to come back? Yeah, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure it was a question for, for today, but I, I have noticed that there has been some opposition to planning applications for change of use to children's homes uh, at, at, bor at various boroughs and districts. And, um, and I'm just wondering what, what, what's being done to, to try and uh, battle that, because obviously in order to provide the beds, we, uh, we, we need the premises. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Peter, that, if I could just interject there, yeah. Peter, very valid question, mate, but we need to stick to the budget. Yeah, um, okay. Perhaps yeah. officers will note that and come back yeah. to you. Yeah, and I'm happy to pick that up with you outside of this uh, meeting, Peter. Thank yeah, you. and I, if I might just observe, yeah, thanks, thanks for that intervention, David. But uh, yes, it is a, a very valid question in terms of the capacity of the portfolio. Can I please ask when you do respond that you uh, circulate all all members who uh, have appeared on this uh, this meeting list, including the panel, of course. But uh, clearly, it's it's a matter that, that that could have a bearing on your capacity to deliver. So that's a, a valid point. Um, I I gather that Dee is now in the meeting. Dee, sorry, we got to your question mm -hmm. before you. Uh, arrived my dear but welcome and uh, I'm sure you'll be able to participate as we go forward so can I now please move on uh, to the question uh, around increasing 
uh, the increases of the average cost of placements. And uh, Steve Jarvis is, is the lead on the first question here. Uh, thanks very much. I mean, the last question, this one and the next one are all related. So hopefully John Hale will still have something to ask when we get to this question. I mean, th 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 there's clearly an issue uh, around both numbers of payment, number of placements available. Uh, and as a result of that, the, the cost of places going up in the marketplace. Um, um, and uh, Miranda has already touched on the uh, on the strategy of providing more in-house places. Um, but are there other plans to address the the medium and long term impacts on placement costs? Because my understanding is that even with the projected increase in in-house places, there'll still be a fairly significant reliance upon independent placements. So what are we doing to address the yeah. fact that the cost of those continues to increase? Yeah, um, I'll start and then I'll, I'll invite officers to, to come in. So no, you're absolutely right, Steve. And, um, you know, the independent placement market, you know, we've seen the, the costs increasing um, and inflation just, yeah, even though um, general inflation is reducing, independent placement provider inflation is not. Um, and that's why I think it's probably a, a, a mixed um, approach really that is what we need to take because there will always perhaps be some children and young people who need to be accommodated in independent placements because ultimately it's about supporting their needs. So um, for some that absolutely will be the requirement that maybe foster care wouldn't be the most appropriate place for them. However, um, where we can increase the number of foster carers Absolutely, we will. And as has been mentioned, our pilot, uh, foster care pilot for these specialised foster carers, which, um, you know, we will support them to look after children with more complex needs than they would normally. Um, and that will then help to reduce the, the demand for those independent placements. So they would perhaps presumably those children, young people would previously been accommodated in an independent placement. So there is that cost avoidance um, associated with that. Uh, Miranda, do you want to, or Joe, do you want to come in at this stage? Thank you. Miranda first, I'll, I'll chip in if, if need be. Thank you. Sure, happy to come in. Um, so um, thank you, Fiona. Um, so yes, uh, in addition to sort of our strategy to build in-house capacity, regionally, we're already part of a well-established group um, in the eastern region called the CRAG, where we work together to try to bear down on private providers in terms of commissioning, bear down on, on costs, and jointly commission wherever we can. We have also um, put in a bid to the Department for Education to be a pathfinder um, as a region, to be one of the pathfinders that trials some new approaches with um, collective commissioning. Uh, at the moment, that bid is, is in with the DfE and we, we, we're waiting to hear back. So we are doing everything we can as a region, working with colleagues um, to try to, to bear down on costs it is a challenge because this is a this is a challenge nationally and at the moment I think it's fair to say that you, you've said it yourself, Steve, that um, demand is outstripping supply and to a certain extent um, the private providers can name their price, particularly if local authorities are in an emergency situation, but we are sort of linking with our regional colleagues to do everything we can alongside really bolstering our in-house capacity. Now, when we get to um, the end of residential strategy two, um, we should have reduced reliance on the independent sector significantly. Um, at the moment, you know, we have we have roughly about 66 children in, in independent placements, um, but if we, we will have built our beds up to about 53, so we will have really sort of reduced reliance. That said, um, you know, you're absolutely right, the children with particularly complex needs, there'll always be um, a need to rely um, on small amounts of sort of commissioned private resource. Jo, did you want to add to that? No, I think it's a full answer, thank you. Yeah, yeah. thank you. And uh, Steve, if I may just add, that also um, is one of the reasons why, you know, we've increased allowances to our foster carers because actually we we recognise that, you know, they have been impacted by the cost of living crisis. Um, and so we've, you will have seen that in the budget, there's an increase to the allowances um, following the increase last year. So that's uh, two years in a row. And that's absolutely right and proper to do because it's a competitive market. Um, and as I said, we do know that our foster carers tell us they like 
um, being foster carers in Hertfordshire because of the support they get. And it is a potentially um, more cost efficient option for those children where it is safe um, to do so. Um, and, and of course, I think we're ahead of the game in some respects. So speaking to colleagues across the country, some um, local authorities have no in-house children home beds. Um, but we started in 2019. And as Miranda said, you know, we're ambitious to get to 53. So um, we're quite along the way, um, all at 27 at the moment. So thank you. Right, Steve, technically speaking, we're out of time on that question, but, uh, but but there was one obvious one that came from Miranda's response, and that was the reference to residential strategy two. The timeline, I think, is actually vital here. And uh, I mean, clearly, I haven't got time to examine it now, but I have to say to you that uh, I certainly would be wanting information in terms of what that timeline is and your capacity to deliver it, because it does yeah. seem essential to your strategy. So possibly yeah. one of the recommendations might well come out there to uh to, 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 would include that steve are you happy can i can i move on uh yes i think so thank thank you very much in which case can i go to john hale please yeah uh, and thank you and, and to certain extent as steve forecast the question i'm going to ask is has partially been answered already but I've, i think there is some aspects here that it's still worth and it picks up on what richard has just said it's you know we know there are pressures from increasing demand and increasing costs um we've got a capital bid investment in, within the pack as i understand it how are we you know have you thoroughly assessed are you able to thoroughly assess whether those sums you've got in the ip are going to be adequate to manage the anticipated growth both in demand and costs um yeah um no absolutely um joe do you want to come in on that first and then yeah uh, absolutely i mean there, there was three very briefly, there are three parts, uh, I think, to, to this answer. I mean, first of all, the, our investment through the, this current budget and the measures that we're taking, the sorts of strategies that you've heard Fiona and Miranda touch on, are all based on really hard analysis of our data, of the numbers of children that we not only have at the moment, but we see coming through the system, tracking back across the last few years, but also the level of need and what we've seen in recent years is that increased level of need, particularly social, emotional and mental health needs. We've also, because we've had this strategy in hand since 2019, we've been able to pull together a significant amount of experience and learning from our phase one of the residential strategy, really thinking through what were some of the, the, the blockages or bottlenecks that we hit. I mean, the pandemic's an obvious one, but there are many more factors that we've taken into account, both in terms of getting planning permission, <coughs> someone's already touched on that, um, but also uh, Ofsted registration, recruitment of sufficiently experienced um, and trained staff. Um, so there's a number of things that, uh, you know, we, we plan for in our timeline. And I think um, our, our accelerated timeline, so we're really being ambitious about how quickly can we build or create these further 22 uh, places is around 13 to 14 months. Now, that's an ambitious accelerated timeline and one that we'll keep constantly under review. And the third point I would make is, you know, it, it really is important to take a balanced and realistic approach. Uh, approach here we don't you know we, we need to think about what is realistic in terms of the properties that we know are available the numbers of children coming through um and, and, our, and our capacity to really drive those forward at pace we keep it constantly under review so if for example in a year's time we think there's both more need and there's certainly more uh uh, requirement to go faster or, or, or to go bigger, then we'll do that and we'll continue to have those conversations through subsequent uh, budget setting um, IP processes. Um, Miranda, do you want to add to that at all? Just to say, Joe. so with residential strategy two, we've, as Joe said, we're benefiting from the learning of strategy one, but we're taking it in a phased approach. So the first phase is to finish off the beds from strategy one and develop the emergency accommodation within strategy two. The second phase is to develop, develop the further 20 beds. And phase three would be to do some smart commissioning of um, wilderness type provision, which is a uh, experiential um, type of provision for young people who go, they go and stay in, in, in sort of outdoor setting and do all sorts of activities alongside sort of therapeutic interventions. But uh, the essential point mm -hmm. I wanted to make is we will be reviewing each phase as we go along based on need and based on, you know, um, how progress has been so far. So I think with residential strategy one, 
and we said we're going to do 31 beds within X amount of time. Then we had the pandemic, which obviously slowed us down. But there were rather unforeseen things that we didn't know at that, that point that slowed us down. We're taking a much more considered approach. And rather than just saying we're going to do it all in one go, doing it in phases and evaluating how we go as, as, as we progress. Yeah, and of course, um, we residential strategy one was impacted by COVID, which caused um, delays to the progression. But actually, we have caught up significantly since then. Um, and, you know, having a phased approach is absolutely a sensible one. We just need to be mindful and manage expectations that, you know, it is all dependent on uh, suitable accommodation and sites um, and also workforce recruitment, which I know perhaps will be another key area um, for discussion, because we know across the country, I think 20 percent of uh, children's home managers have probably left the, the system within the last couple of years. So but again, that's why we have another strand, which is our residential academy, where we train our own um Children's Fiona, home Fiona, workers. I've, Thank Fiona, you. I've, I've, I, I hate to cut out you, but we're over time on this question. Uh, Thank you. Look, I've, had a, I've had a note of, of, of a member wanting to speak, but uh, um, perhaps we can we can bring in if we've got time at the end. Perhaps we can bring in additional questions or or questions, follow up questions. So please make a note of what you would like to ask, and we'll see if we can get through this. And if there's spare time, I'll I'll, I'll do it. Can I then Thank please you. move on to John Sloan, please? Okay, thank you. Um, timelines have been mentioned um, already quite um, quite a bit. Um, let me. Sorry, I just lost my um, questions. I mean, oh, hi there. Um, so, but can you uh, perhaps just help us understand a little bit more the uh, the timelines uh, involved, and, and in particular what the risks would be uh, should the timelines not be be met. Um, and, and then, and then, if they're not met, what contingencies would you have in place to actually uh, mitigate the impacts? Yeah. So the the, the timelines are um, the phasing approach, which Miranda's outlined, um, roughly the accelerated 13 months to open a children's home because by the time you involve Ofsted registration and uh, find a site and workforce recruitment, etc. Um, and then that is tied in with, um, obviously ongoing monitoring and review which joe has mentioned and clearly um the external factors are around availability of sites which i mentioned and or workforce recruitment so all of those things can impact but we continue to monitor it and alongside that we continue with our fostering strategy to recruit more foster carers um and you know to develop more residential care workers so this it's Again, as, as I said at the beginning, it's a multi multifaceted approach um, and of course working to reunify children and young people with their families and working hard with families to prevent children from coming into care unless absolutely necessary. Uh, Joe, did you want to add anything? To very very briefly, just to be really specific on the date. So we our current residential strategy of creating an additional 31 beds. That will be complete by the end of this calendar year. So by December 24, we will have opened our remaining Four beds. Um, we'll remain, uh, we'll develop and open a further 20 beds, and we're aiming to do that by December 27. Um, and then uh, the third phase, which Miranda touched on, which was the 12 week wilderness, um, if, if we're going to take that forward, because um, we'll do that subject to review, uh, that will be taken forward uh, thereafter. Thank you, John. Are you happy with that response? You're, you're mute, John. You're mute, John. That's fine. Thank, Thank you, you, Richard. Thank you, Joe. Right, Thank John, you. John Howells indicated he wants to come up with a follow up, please. Yeah, just a, a quickly. What's the level of contingency if you built into these budgets for this? So so I mean, we've. We've built the budgets and the investment around um, what what oh, I, I'm not going to put a number on it, but we, we we've built quite a tight uh, investment strategy and one that will keep under review. We think it's a realistic investment based on our previous experience and what we know of the market, um, but we will keep it under review. And as we said, uh, some of the obstacles that we're facing or that we might face are things such as getting hold of a building, 
there can be delays in terms of refurbishment or planning or the recruitment of staff and the registration with Ofsted. And we've built all of that into our timeline. If we if I mean, I think the question uh, earlier was about what continue what contingency measures have we got in place if if it doesn't go to plan, if it's slowed down or um, and, and as Fiona said, we've got this is just one part of our strategy to do more locally. We've got a massive emphasis on keeping children home safe and not coming to care in the first place. We have a very strong, ambitious foster care strategy. And this residential strategy is one part of that picture. We also work very closely with local independent providers, um, including the voluntary sector. So, um, you know, providers such as One YMCA in terms of our supported accommodation. We work very closely with local independent providers um, to also create provision. And that mixed market is, a, is another key strand of our strategy um, and one that we'll continue to push forward with. Thank yeah. you, Joe. Uh, Janet Jones, please. And just, just to add, Ray, this runs alongside all the work that runs taking to return children home through our Building Bridges project. So as much as we are looking to support children that will need accommodation in future, alongside that is a strategy to return correctly um, and uh, you know obviously with assessment or with support a number of children home safely with good oversight as well so that as as joe has said it's it's one of a a number of strategies that are in place to make sure we have the right children in the right placements at the right time it, cared for in, in in the best way we can do thank you very much now i must move on um i hope hope members got <laughs> enough out of that one um nigel bell please yeah, thank you, Richard. Uh, and good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, I've got one that follows on. I'll have another one after that if I've got time. But uh, additionally, what measures are in place to address potential financial implications and ensure the continued well-being of children in need, considering the demographic pressures and the current economic challenges faced by residents? I know there's various points I've got here to come back on that, but if, if you could just ask that basic question. Yeah. Yeah, no, thank, th thank you very much. And absolutely. And as I mentioned, I think in my um, early on, so we have, you know, we're very fortunate in Hertfordshire through all the work that we do to support children, young people and families, that we have low numbers of children um, on child protection plans. We have low numbers of children in care and low numbers of children in need. Mm -hmm. So regarding specific support, um, can I, who would like to come in on that? Is that Janet? I think it's, I think it's probably... I think it's probably Janet. I mean, I think it's yeah. a really important question. We do know that locally and indeed nationally that more children are living in very difficult uh, financial circumstances with their families. And that is being reflected both in terms of numbers of children accessing free school meals, but also the numbers of children who've been referred into our social care front door in need yeah. of help. We've con we're tracking at about 17 percent higher than pre-pandemic levels. It appears to have flattened off at that level. So it's not going up. Um, all, all the time, but it is nonetheless sort of settling down at a much higher level of need. Um, but that said, we are incredibly successful in terms of uh, continuing to have low numbers of children who are subject to or, or uh, supported through child protection plans or in care. And that is because we have a very strong early help offer that Janet leads on. So I'll let Janet just give you some of the highlights of that. Yeah, I was, I was just I was thinking very specifically around the the offer to our children who are supported by child in need plans. Yeah. And those children are supported by our family safeguarding teams um, where we have multi agency um, colleagues who are they don't work that they are part of one team. So it's not these are not professionals that we that we tap into. They physically are together. So we have mental health professionals, domestic abuse professionals, drug and alcohol professionals who work really, really hard alongside, not two, but alongside families to motivate them in a strength based way to make um, required changes that they need to keep their children safe. And that way of working is is very successful in terms of bringing down all the numbers um, that we've talked about. So that, that model is, is effective in that way. Um, working together was updated at the end of 2023. And what will that will also enable us to do is to look for some children um, where appropriate to be allocated to non-qualified social workers. Uh -huh. So very much still within a social care team yeah. with, with social work oversight. Um, and as I say, we will need to be, as we develop that in the coming year, we will need to think very carefully about who that cohort of children are to make sure that it's done um, in, a, in, a, in a safe and planned way. But that will alleviate some of those potential pressures around social work capacity. Right, Nigel, can I just, just I, I can see you're desperate to get in, but very quickly, can I just remind you, we're dealing with the budget here. There are issues yeah. with 
which clearly will need to be teased out and should go through the panels, to be honest with you, and if we can. So uh, you've got um, you have a, a, a minute left to ask your second question. OK, I was just going to ask about that. Um, page more the, the children in need, but OK, I'll go on to this. Um, obviously, I've been on the children's services um, panel since 2009 and we always used to we always talk about early intervention so following up on early intervention to minimize the need for higher cost solutions in complex cases later in their care program and we know them the costliest are the 10 to 14 year olds now we've been told obviously in children's services panels and by joe and other officers about the that particularly complex and and, and difficult cases 10 to 14 year olds what are those um you know what what early interventions can you offer maybe even before that to stop so many or not so many but to stop the rate that we have of 10 to 14 year olds who are the most complex yeah, yeah. And, and and i think it's um thank you nigel and i think you know what's very important is the early help and support so if you can get in and support a family early on then you can prevent need from escalating and so not only is that better for the children young people and families but it has a cost avoidance as well so that's very much our focus um and certainly within you know our family safeguarding model which yeah. is uh, renowned nationally as a really strong model of supporting families that's multi disciplinary team um, so it's working with families to support families and of course then early help and our um, the work that's done through family centres and it's all about providing that early help when it's when it's needed really to prevent escalation colleagues did you want to add I'm anything sure. else Brianna, can I, can oh. I, I, I'm sorry to wind you up but, but I'm up okay. on time now. however okay. it seems to me again uh, this, we'll is come back on that. this is an area which probably ought to be uh, dealt with uh, by bringing a paper to the appropriate panel because it clearly it, it, it's a detailed and complex area and I'm glad Nigel's asked it but I mean I've got to deal with the funding issues here and and the the, the, the these lovely little sort of nuances which clearly are a huge interest uh, need to be sorted out outside of this particular meeting can I then please go on to uh, Peter Hebden yeah thank you Richard um, the council's previously approved a three-year investment to um, pilot a new approach to support more children to leave care and safely return home. So how will the uh, how will the investment in the in the program uh, impact the quality of services? And, and how is the anticipated cost reduction achievable without compromising care standards? Yeah, so um, I'll start in this and then I'll hand over to uh, Joe. So clearly everything we do to support our children, young people and families, we look at the quality of the care and support. So that's the, the priority because, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's, it's about keeping our children, young people safe um, and in the right environment for them and, the, and their families. So that's the starting point, if you like. In terms of the, the level of detail in how it's carried out on a daily basis, then Joe, can I hand it over, over to you? Thank you. Yeah, and, and Miranda can always go, or, or, or uh, Janet, Janet. Probably Miranda can go into some detail. But I, I think for me, when I read this question, I thought I'm going to break it into two two pieces. One is, look, we, we do have significant investment and significant success in our extension of our family safeguarding model to support children to safely return home when it's in their best interest to do so. And we always make those decisions first and foremost based on what's right for the child. Um, regardless of a, a funding context or anything like that, we, we, we continue to have a really strong focus on the child's welfare. And we've seen success in that. We've returned over 20 children home since its launch in October um, of 2022. Um, and, and that equates to significant cost avoidance, um, but also significant success and good outcomes for those children and young people. And the ILACs, the Inspection of Children's Services, last January noted that that, that's, that innovation we called it our building bridges team, is a really good um, example of how we use those wider family networks to safely support children to come home. That said, that has no direct or adverse impact on uh, the care standards, the standards of children that we uh, maintain where they do need to come into care. If a child does need to come into care, again, we look first and foremost at their needs um, and ensure that they are in a home that is loving and is of the best of high quality. And we've got a really strong quality assurance framework around that, which Miranda can give you. I'm aware of time, but she can give you a few highlights of. Go ahead, Miranda. Sure. I mean, just to, to add to what Joe said, to give you a, a bit of information. So since October 
31 children have returned home in total um, as a result of both building bridges, but also our emergency foster carer program. So emergency foster carers who work really closely with social workers and families to get children safely home where it's appropriate. And we used to make that has avoided costs of 2.9 million so far in the, in the last just over a year. Um, we have a really tight um, QA framework. We're required to do so um, in terms of Ofsted and, and of course in terms of what's best for children. So we have rigorous monthly performance meetings with all our service management managers and heads of service where we monitor all performance really carefully. In addition to that, we have a um, um, audit program. So we have two practice weeks and an internal um, audit uh, three times a year. So in total, we audit roughly up to 450 cases a year. So that's um, managers and senior managers looking really close at cases, looking at outcomes, looking at what we're doing, making th sure our thresholds are appropriate. And in addition to that, we have themed and focused audits. So we have a team of experienced social workers who go in and look at particular um, aspects of practice, making sure we're getting thresholds right, um, we do regular audits in terms of cases that are tipping over into the child protection threshold and then children that are going into care, looking at the reasons why the interventions we've tried and, and you know what, what hasn't worked well and why children have ended up sort of escalating in the system. So that's a, a requirement of professional practice, but also an Ofsted requirement. And Janet might want to come in and add to that. Just very quickly, the children that return home, they remain open to children's services. Most of these children have a, a, a care order in place that was implemented through the court process. And there's a whole court process that then revokes that care order later down the line. So that there's there are our own processes, uh, but they're equally, for most of these children, court oversight as well in terms of quality and safety in returning that young person home. Yeah, so that very strong measures in place and processes to safeguard the children and young people and of course as Miranda has mentioned the 31 children and young people who were returned home has a cost avoidance of 2.9 million so just in in the context of this budget meeting um, I think that's that's very relevant thank you please Richard if I just uh, <clears throat> so what you're saying is basically with regardless of the money spent with the building bridges and the intervention and the continued supervision that actually, actually uh, quite often it could lead to care standard improving rather than being impacted yeah. upon. Yeah, and uh, there's that ongoing monitoring. Fiona, Fiona, yeah, I, I have to stop you there on that one because we're running into uh, the next question. My apologies, okay. but uh, okay. uh, uh, Cheryl Hunter, please. Hello. Um, yes, we've covered some of this already, but um, with the addition of the residential beds in house, how does this plan align with the goal of keeping children safe at home and in their communities um, and and will the extra beds be sufficient in the future um, and what steps are being taken to maintain the quality of care in residential settings? Yeah, so if, if just picking up on the last point first, so the quality of care in residential settings. So all homes are um, inspected by Ofsted on a very regular basis. Um, they're unannounced inspections. And um, I, at the beginning of, of the meeting, I think I mentioned that all seven of our homes are rated good or outstanding by Ofsted, which clearly is very important for the care um, of our children and young people. Um, that was the, the last point first. Um, in terms of the uh, assurance um, on the care, I think we we sort of covered that in terms of the ongoing monitoring and processes and audit. Uh, Joe, did you want to yeah, come in there? Yeah. Thank you. I mean, just, just going back to your point about how does our plan align, the part about, you know, increasing residential care, but also uh, keeping children safe at home in their communities. The golden thread that runs through all of this is doing what's right for children and young people to keep them safe. Um, and therefore, we have a very wide strategy. Quite rightly, we have a very wide strategy because the diversity of children's needs means that we cannot have a one size fits all or take a blanket approach. We need to look first and foremost at what children, young people and their families need and develop our interventions and our services and our approach around that. But throughout all of those strategies, there's a focus on uh, building the strengths of families, um, supporting and empowering them to uh, resolve their own problems as early as possible. 
am and where possible keep children safe at home and in their local communities. We know that that said there will always be some young people and children for whom the right thing to do is for them to live away from their families and and and, and that will be in a, a whole range of scenarios but the right thing for them to do would be to live safely either in foster care or in residential care or indeed with another member of their family whilst we continue to work and we have very tight care plans around their progression um, once they have been placed in in some form of uh, care so that where possible and we can reunite them with their families safely at some point in the future. So our strategy um, is, is unified by an overarching and very strong focus on getting it right for the individual needs of children, young people and keeping them safe. Um, so I hope that answers all of your yeah your points yeah. but do tell me if I, I missed anything and and just to to add Cheryl um so when we had our recent ILEX inspection Ofsted recognized the strengths of this approach um for keeping our children and young people safe and we were uh, rated outstanding um for our children's social care and that has taken into account all of the measures that have been described um, and the strengths of all of those working together because as Joe said it's not one size fits all for our children young people and thank you Thank you. Chair Miranda, Miranda. Oh, yeah, Miranda's got your hand up uh, and I'm running out of time on this one so quickly, please. I can be very quick. And um, just, uh, uh, Fiona's already said, we have a compare, one of the lowest rates of children looked after um, when compared to statistical neighbours in the country. Um, so we, we know from that we are not taking children into care unnecessarily. And as part of our QA and our regular audit, we are always scrutinising those cases and looking at, you know, children who are in care, why they're in care, or all, all that sort of thing. In terms of your question about whether the residential strategy will be enough, just going back to my answer before. So at the moment, we've got rough Roughly sort of 66 children in external uh, independent residential placements. We will have built our, our um, internal capacity up to 53, which is a sizable amount. We can't sort of predict where we exactly we'll be in, you know, three years time. Um, but we think that what we're doing will go an enormous way to towards sort of building our in-house capacity and, and being really robust with that. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, is Graham Lawrence on the call, please? Haven't seen him. Uh, if he's not, can I move then, please, to uh, D. Morton? A question on staff. No response there. Right. Can uh, in that yeah. case, Seamus? Uh, oh, beg your pardon. Have, have I got? Uh, oh, am I on? No. Seamus, can you uh, come in, please? I can. Um, yes, I can. I can. I can talk. And uh, uh, my question is is a very general question that maybe Fiona wants to kick off on, and that there's a very impressive range of directional targets um, mm -hmm. which have been laid out in uh, what we want to achieve, which is tied in with the BBE. Sorry, BEE -E, B um, framework. Uh, Yes, yes, the outcome strategy. So, so I suppose my question really is around about um, how do you intend to measure the successes in relation to this, uh, these points uh, yeah. and, and these strategies as, as the journey continues? Yeah, no, thank you, Seamus. And absolutely, an ongoing review and monitoring is, is key to everything Children's Services does. And we have very strong quality assurance and, and audits. Um, more than I had expected when I first took on this role. Um, and that's been incredibly reassuring. Additionally, um, colleagues who uh, sit on the Children, Young People and um, Families panel will know that reports are brought regularly um, with performance um, indicators and updates. And, and I think we give them fairly good scrutiny, I have to say. Um, I would say that maybe as I'm chair, but I hope colleagues would agree. We do delve into where uh, performance is uh, not where we would like it to be. And equally, um, we comment on on where performance is, is perform you know, is excellent. And I think it's about seven out of 10 performance indicators are in the top three quartile in the country. So uh, we're really proud of that. And we've spoken about the low numbers of children in care, which are half the national average. And with that comes a cost saving, of course, <coughs> cost avoidance. Does that help, it, Seamus? Yeah, it does. No, no, it's good flavour. It's, it's, thank you very much and keep up the good work. No, thank you very thank much. You very much. Um, 
if if D Hart is on the call, D, can I ask you to ask mm -hmm. the question on how the service intends to effectively realise its goals? That's uh, uh, two up from from saying this is question. Right. Okay. How does the service intend to efficiently realise the goals of improving outcomes for family and children under five years of age through supportive measures for parents and closing the attainment gap? in early childhood development. Sorry, that was quite wordy, wasn't it? No, thank you. Thank you, Dee. I think we get the flavour of that. And, you know, you're absolutely right. So um, supporting, you know, children, young children to improve um, their outcomes and to close the attainment gap is, is critically important. And across Hertfordshire, you know, we, we know that I think it's um, over 90 percent of our two year olds are accessing free early education. And that's significantly above our statistical neighbours and um, and England uh, average, and then our three and four year olds very strong uh, take up as well. And clearly that's that's really critical. Um, and it's about working comprehensively across the system. If you like to support children um, early years, you know, all of our um, early years providers are 92% are of our early years providers are, are good or outstanding. And that's incredible um, because that clearly shows that our providers are um, are very strong in Hertfordshire and actually are providing the best opportunities for those children in the early years. Uh, Joe, did you want to come in, please? I think that's a really good answer. I just to add very briefly, rather than repeat what you said, I think alongside all of that, I mean, we've got a very strong family central family hub, hub model that we're currently recommissioning across the whole of Hertfordshire. And that's a joint uh, commissioning approach with public health nursing so essentially what we've got is integrated health and social care support going into um, children under the age of five so right through from the antenatal up until the age of five where parents and children access a range of support from open access sort of drop-in type activities through to more targeted family support services for those who really need it including children with um, special educational needs or developmental delay um, but also other children who, who where their families might need additional and targeted support and within that Fiona quite rightly uh, flagged the early years education but it's our public health nursing so our health visitors we commission them to give advice and information about the access to two and three and four year old free free early education places. And we think that's really important in terms of providing a structured learning early years environment for some of our most vulnerable children. And I'm delighted that that's increased year on year for the past four years, so that we now benchmark incredibly well um, with statistical neighbours and Eastern Region uh, local authorities. As Fiona said, over 90 uh, percent of our, our three and four year olds are accessing those places um, and it, it's around uh, 90 uh, for, for vulnerable two year olds as well so some really great work happening in that space. And uh, Thank you. Just, ju and just to say having worked in early years um, for 10 years mm -hmm. um, I absolutely know the benefit of when you know those young children do come into a setting because actually the support um, that they get at that age is incredibly important and it's not just the support the children get it's the support their parents get so it's the whole family support and actually if we can you know going back to giving every child the best start in life if we can support children and families early then we can prevent um or reduce um escalation further down the line which and in the terms of the budget um not only is this best for families but actually in terms of the budget this it really has um you know it, it makes complete sense. Thank you. Any other contributions from the officers of that one? Dee, are you uh, content with that response? Absolutely. Thank you, Richard. Thank, thank you very much. I still can't see Mr. Morton on the, uh, or Dee Morton on the, uh, uh, on the call. So perhaps I might uh, intervene and, and ask the question myself. Um, considering the risk of losing highly qualified professionals, can you elaborate on the specific measures in place to address the competitive pay and conditions and retain skilled staff within the council? It's, yeah. a, it's a question which is a, clearly uh, important across the entire uh, breadth of all portfolios, but particularly in demand and services where qualified staff are, you know, are just essential and we're all fishing in a very small pool. Yeah, no, thank you, Chair. And you're, you're absolutely right. Workforce is it's an ongoing challenge. And, you know, we know nationally and um, there are fewer social workers in work than there were maybe three or four years ago. So that's a challenge. However, in Hertfordshire, we don't just go, OK, well, that's a shame. And um, we have a very strong workforce uh, strategy and uh, within 
children's services in particular and that involves you know our, our campaigns it involves we have a, a social worker apprenticeship scheme which you know where by Hertfordshire County Council supports staff to gain a social work qualification and that's a three-year qualification and that's you know that's fantastic and it's about ongoing support of staff because it's not just about recruiting them it's also about retaining them so um, that's really key and in terms of um, the support for staff uh, supervision which um, colleagues will recognise is incredibly important when you're dealing with quite challenging families or as as in families with, with challenges, um, then the supervision of staff is incredibly important. Uh, Joe, do you want to speak a little bit more about the specifics of the workforce strategy within children's services? Thank you. Yeah, I'll actually bring Janet in, I think, just to okay, talk about, I mean, our, our workforce strategy is targeted at those areas across our workforce where we've got challenges. So it's social work, it's residential social workers and and, and education psychologists. And that's the, all of those, that, that is having an effect across the country. So it's not Hertfordshire specific. And in fact, we do relatively well. And I think that speaks both to the power of Hertfordshire as a county council and our strength and our reputation, both as a place to work and a place to live, but also very clear vision for children's services to get it right for children and young people. But in terms of some of the mechanics of what we actually do, Janet, I'll hand over to you to talk about the social work bit, please. Thank you. Certainly. Um, so as Fiona has said, there are less social workers in the system than at any other time since data collection started. So what that means is growing our own is more important than ever. So in addition to the apprenticeship scheme that Fiona's mentioned, there's a, um, a, a project called Frontline, um, where within a year, postgraduate students come and learn on the job to be social workers. We currently have a cohort of about 16, that will be 20, increasing to 20 in September. There's also a programme called Step Up, um, it does a similar thing over a slightly longer period. There's the apprenticeship scheme. We also have students from local universities that will often stay with us. So what that means is at any one time, as I say, those, those courses run over slightly different time periods. We normally have around 30 to 40 students, social workers within our system, um, and that will be increasing to about 40 to 50 um, from September this year. Um, and then what's really important is then is retaining that cohort of staff. So looking at support around emotional well-being, the number of children allocated to those workers and all of those key factors that, that make working somewhere attractive are part of our workforce strategy are regularly looked into regularly aligned um, with, with feedback sort on a regular basis from from the workforce and alongside that we then will also be quite creative so have joint um, events social recruitment events with adult care services to make sure we try and get the balance of more experience as well as um, homegrown social workers in, but there's a huge focus on the whole strategy around recruitment and retention of social workers in Hertfordshire. Yeah. Thank you, Miranda. Just to add to that, we've got our groundbreaking residential academy. Um, so that is a, a homegrown uh, a service that we've created ourselves. And what we do is we train residential workers on the job. Um, we have had so far eight graduates over the last 18 months. That doesn't sound like very much, but in the world of residential, that's actually a huge amount. Um, and we have seven people enrolled currently. And the really positive uh, side to all of this is all eight graduates have stayed with us they haven't gone and found another job yeah that, that's that, the best, best piece of news i've heard today i, I was thinking, yeah. i was about to ask you about golden keys and the and the like but i don't need to clearly yeah. you're doing a good thing um, and, and Jeff, well, chair yeah, one of our um, one of our lovely um one of our lovely young graduates um was a chef before he became a children's home residential care worker and uh, colleagues may have seen um, uh, an article, a news article about him recently. But, you know, that's just one example of people. Again, it's Hertfordshire thinking outside the box. OK, there's a challenge. What do we do? Right. Let's grow our own. Um, we've had graphic designers. We've had um, somebody who worked in a gym um, who decided they actually know wanted to come and work with children. We've supported them to do that. 17 week program. It's fabulous. Uh, Paul and I have been to one of the graduation ceremonies and it was just great to hear why they've come in to work with children, young people, and then how they've grown throughout the program and then the support that they're giving to those children, and young people across Hertfordshire. So it's really positive. Thank you very much. I have to say, just as, as a quick aside, having cooked for a large number of people on the many occasions, the stress is only exceeded by looking after my grandchildren. So there you are. Um, officers and uh, Fiona and, 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 and members, we are actually on time. We've actually got to the end of those questions. I know Nigel was desperate to come back 
on something. Nigel, providing it is it is rel related directly to the budget, uh, you've got a minute. No, he's 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 I'll on. Get something. back on again no, now. He, Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you've caught me unawares. No, uh, I was really just, it was just going back to my original one about the demographic pressures and the children in need. I was going back, but I was going into details really about the uh, the revenue savings. We can go into that in Children's Services panel, I suppose, the page yeah. 91 and what you were saying on, on the demographic pressures and uh, how you might help on that. I don't know if anyone can, can look at that or I can bring up the panel. Thank you. I'd, I'd be grateful if you would, because clear, clearly we're we're out of time now. But uh, uh, members and everybody, thank I'll you email. so much. I've thank got, you. Uh, I have a meeting a summary summary meeting to conclude the recommendations scheduled for three thirty to four. Uh, and and uh, can somebody please remember uh, remind me please who who is expected to be on that? Uh, you all are well uh, uh, members, not, not officers. Uh, no, they, the office the officers get a furlough at this stage. That's but yeah, just a just a reminder, we're back. We're back at three thirty till four, where we'll join. We'll be joined. Well, first of all, we're dealing with the education libraries and lifelong learning recommendations. But um, at the risk of boring you, I think you you actually might find it useful. Um, and, and then Dave, we'll pick up yours at the conclusion of that. At approximately three uh, forty-five. Oh, sorry, David. And um, just for clarification, are we required to be back for that session or not? No. 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 Okay. Thank you. That was my understanding. I just well, wanted this, to clarify. This, 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 this is the hanging judge uh, speaking. No. <laughs> <laughs> but it's on the no, same that, link, is it? It's on the same link. We use the same really, link. I'm really grateful to everybody for 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 um, adhering to the time. The questions were succinctly answered. I'm very grateful to you. Thank you very much. I'll see you in, Richard, in half an hour. Richard, yeah, are we thank on? You.
uh, this is the, the the point in the uh, after the afternoon sessions where we uh, we consider the, <laughs> the, the 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 summary and recommendations um, portfolio portfolio by portfolio. So we'll obviously be starting with um, with John and his team. Over to you, John. Well, we're going to talk to is it Joanna? Are you going to do? no no Natalie? You've got Natalie. Thank, Thank you, Natalie. Um, Joanna and I are trying to do something clever, so we'll see whether it works. We're going to share this screen so you can see our beautiful faces. And then uh, we've put together some recommendations for each of the portfolios. And we'll put those on the screen so that you don't have to try and retain what we've um, described to you. So we'll take each um, portfolio separately. So we're looking to spend around 15 minutes um, um, on education, libraries and lifelong learning, where I'll do a very short summary. Um, I will then pass to John Sloan to lead the debate of the members uh, from that uh, portfolio group. And then um, when that's been concluded, the recommendations have been confirmed. I'll pass to Joanna, who will um, do the similar uh, process for children, young people um, and families. So if I just kick on, because time is off the essence. Um, um, you had, I mean, the, the, this is a slightly strange portfolio, I always think, education, libraries and lifelong learning. It's a bit kind of strange whipping from libraries in, in, into, into education and SEND. But I think with the questions that you posed to the uh, cabinet member and the officers, um, you were able to cover the diversity of that portfolio pretty, pretty thoroughly. Um, you talked about the library's budget. You got some assurance around the uh, ability to to achieve that. You talked about archives, accreditation, maintenance of um, resources there, and and got some uh, um, reassurance around that. Um, obviously, there was uh, a lot of time spent looking at SEND and the action plan and uh, consideration of recruitment, retention, um, professionalisation, retaining caseloads, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and there is a, a, the, the, because of the debate that took place around that, um, there may well be a, a recommendation that comes forward from that. But I'll just continue with the short summary. Um, you asked some questions about mainstream in terms of uh, school budgets, if they're, if they're achieving a deficit, and you heard an explanation of how HOTS for Learning supports that. You talked about transport around um, um, home to school and how the um, authority is trying different approaches, which also um, not only save money, but actually help to build independence of the young people. Um, so you, you you got some detail around that. And then uh, around um, support for young people and youth services. And I think that this one was, was, again, a little bit more of a contentious area in terms of the support that's available for young people to keep them um, um, in school, et cetera, et cetera. Again, maybe suggesting uh, uh, um, um, a recommendation um, uh, around that one. So if Joanna would like to just put up the, uh, the suggested recommendations, these, these are not the recommendations that you have to accept. They are there just to help to give um, some framework to, to the debate that John is going to lead. And so the, the two recommendations from ELLL are what contingency is in place should the SEND action plan not deliver the anticipated savings and uh, that the service undertakes a review to ascertain the effect of the new approach to youth <laughs> services and particularly in regard to uh, prevention. So, John, at that point, I will stop speaking and pass back to you for discussion with your group. OK, thank you, uh, Natalie, for putting those recommendations together. Uh, so I'll just don't put it up to comments then, really. What, what do you say? John, you've, what gone, you've gone on to mute. John, you've gone, you've gone on to mute. I'm, I'm, I'm not showing oh. his mute. I'm not showing his mute on my system. Can you hear me now? Yes, well, I can hear you. I can hear you, John, quite clearly. Okay. So, so. I can hear him very well. Yeah. Okay, good, good. Oof, that's a relief. Um, shall, shall I just open it up to uh, to members then for comments on? So we've got two proposed recommendations here. Do these uh, do, the, do these reflect our thinking as a group, or are there other recommendations that we would like to make, or would we like to reshape these recommendations? Comments, please. Uh, uh, Jan. Uh, hi. There's just a typo on the second one. It says effective rather than effect. Mm. 
Yeah, but Jan, we've just basically done these as quickly as we can to oh, get yeah, them in no, front of you. That. So just, the, the, just... the wording, if you agree the recommendations, we will we we ex we expect to fine tune the wordings. It's just to give okay. you something to kind of frame your discussion. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't realise. John, John, if I may, please. Uh, with the second one, um, uh, it verbally was you service, particularly comma, particularly in regard to prevention and particularly isn't in there in the text, but it was mm -hmm. in the verbal. Yeah, thank you. Jeff? Um, yeah, a couple of points. Um, services for young people, um, as it came out in the discussion, um, my concern is with, and I, and I have worded something, if you'll just bear with me, I'll bring it up as a recommendation. Uh, Hold on a minute. There it is. Recommendation regarding the, the six youth centres that are closing. Um, and to me, officers should be looking at alternative provision in the towns and villages affected before looking within the district. Um, they were proposing, you know, for centres to be within the districts, which are all extremely large. Um, and they talked about putting them in education settings wherever. And I would say what I've found talking to users of these services, of these centres, the users of the service, uh, they prefer to be away from an education establishment. They were talking about putting them in um, uh, in schools, et cetera. Uh, mm -hmm. To me, they should be in, they were talking about putting them in libraries at one stage. That wasn't mentioned today, but I know that's what they're looking at doing. Um, so my, proposal, my recommendation would be that where the six youth centres are closing, officers should be looking at alternative provision in the town stroke villages affected before looking within the district and avoid education settings wherever possible, e.g. community centres, uh, stroke libraries. Users of the service prefer to be away from education establishments. Um, that was, that's what I would suggest for um, services for young people. And just one other point on uh, SEND. Um, my concern is, is, and I think everyone's concern, is with the EHCPs uh, that they're uh, way behind on. And I think they said their target was 40% uh, um, target reduction, where I think I don't think that's ambitious enough, personally. Um, that's all I would say. I think I got that right. They're talking about 40% yeah. target. I think it should be okay. a lot higher. Does, does there need to be a I, financial angle to a recommendation? Can I, can I just come in on? Oh, Mark, Mark, please do well, come in. Yeah. I think it's, uh, I'm, I'm as being a critic of the team as anybody. I think we have to be fair and say this is within the next six months, which is when they will have to produce a further review. I mean, I, I, I agree with Jeff General's sentiment. And, you know, we've said we think there are not clear plans for achieving. And I raised the question as to when they will actually start to really make significant. I mean, it's a big step. But it's only a, it's an intermediate step. It isn't an acceptable one. But I, I think the point of when they will achieve something which 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 families would think would be an acceptable service because 60%, you know, or 40% not on time and 60% not being of the right quality is pretty damning as a, as an interim. You have to do better than that. So I I just think we need to sort of phrase. The, you know, the lack of certainty as to when they expect to achieve a good quality. And just picking up the other point Jeff made about the the youth services, what worries me is, and they sort of alluded to it, that they would make sure the coverage was still there, but I'm not at all sure that that is very clear as how they're going to do that. So I would want something around the concern that, you know, young people in Hertfordshire will be able to access those services even when they've made those cuts, the ones that the target people that they that they're specifying. So something along those lines I'd like to see included in the recommendations. OK, thank you, Mark. Uh, Chris Lloyd, you got your hand up as well. Brilliant. Thank you for putting the things back on. Uh, can, I'd like to briefly speak on both recommendations. The first one, um what contingency in place 
I don't I don't think mm. I don't think send you know we're spending more money we're not looking for savings here it's more will will the spending that we're doing deliver the action plan and will we will we need more money because I, my understanding is we're we're proposing deficit budgets because of some of this so i think the phrasing of number 1 needs to change and i think on number 2 i've picked up various points i prefer it to say in light of a proposed savings um in the youth service that a report comes back um to the panel so that we can we can understand how the services are going to be protected for the, the young people as was outlined by hero just to just to clarify chris um this is not a panel it's a scrutiny and you know, the no, no. um ip needs to be enacted within this day and the recommendations then go to cabinet on the 12th of February and the 13th of February council meeting. So um, there's a okay. recommendation you can send something to panel, but in terms of this particular recommendation, we can rephrase that so that it picks it up within the framework of what, what, we, uh, yeah, what that, needs that, to be achieved today. No, that's that's absolutely fine. But I don't think number one actually makes sense. I don't yeah. I think we're spending more money on send. I think so, that needs so it. It, yeah, we want yeah. the result. We want yeah, to know. Yeah. So, 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 Chris and other colleagues, I can I can rephrase these. They, these are not yeah. what you have to yeah. accept. They're yeah. there to enable you to just have some debate about it. Do exactly yeah. what you're doing, which is to suggest yeah. a change of wording, which makes it right. And I think you're quite right. You know, if, if we anticipated savings is not the right expression, well, we'll replace it with something else. And you will get to see this before um, it's then sent yeah. on to cabinet members. So you will get. Uh, that ad, ad yeah. extra confidence in that, John. Over yeah, to uh, you. Yeah. So thank you. So thank you. So 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 quite right. Yeah. So we can we can change these recommendations, put new ones in, take 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 them out. I mean, I mean certainly on the on the first one. Um, I mean, uh, yeah, some some good points are there. I think for me, um, clearly the the risk, the financial risk is enormous around um, uh, you know SEND. Uh, and high needs, so there does need to be something, some reflection about, about that in the. Um, it would seem to me in the in the recommendations somewhere. Uh, any other comment, David? Did you have your hand up? Because, mm -hmm. like Chris, I was thinking we're not actually looking for savings here. We're 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 putting a great deal of extra money in, rather than taking money out. So. What I anticipate is an improvement in service and outcomes. So I, I would be looking at it and thinking to myself, you know, what are we going to do if it doesn't deliver the anticipated outcomes? Just a thought. I think that's really good. Oh, for God's sake, come on. Thanks, David. That's absolutely what I was going to say and probably phrased it better than I would. So I fully support what you've just said. So if members are happy with that, I can redraft them and then get them out to you um, tonight, hopefully. Um, and then you can have a look at those um, and then we can get them off to get them off to Cabinet um, and uh, well, get them off to OSC on the 2nd of February 1st uh, for ratification and then off to oh. Cabinet. And council. Like oh, he's back, right. John, you're muted. You're muted, John. Sorry. Um, I've got two hands up, Mark and Michael. Who wants to go first? Shall I go first? Um, as far as uh, youth clubs or youth centres, um, I think we should try and not have them in schools, as Jeff has said, but in uh, village halls and community centres in each of our um, residential areas or our towns. Okay, thank you, Michael. Mark? Well, I just think we need to have something in here about high needs funding because it's um, 
it's absolutely a risk to the authorities' uh, financial yeah. situation of reserves, and not to even mention it. And I think there is, you know, um, we could almost, well, what can we say? I think the, the thing is, I, I recognise that, that we have put in a reserve for it, but the concerns about the lack of high needs funding threatening the even the viability of the council. You know, it's it's an ongoing uh, political thing, but it has real impact financially. So I'd like to see something that refers to that and is recognised as part of this IP process. So, so is that something we could link in with the um, with with the first question? Because because high, high high level needs and send. I mean, there's a definite there's a definite connection there, or or do we actually I, need I, a, a I, separate? I don't think this should be separated. I think it's more that send is sort of the statutory work that I think is going on. As I read this, that's the range of statutory send within the council's own operations, whereas this is to do with the funding for schools and the, and the overspend, the £60 million pounds that uh, yeah, was referred yeah. to. And that could yeah. massively impact on the on the council's yeah. viability. Yeah, like, so, not to repeat, I think yeah. it's. Uh, and and, and I, I would agree. I mean, that's definitely the, the biggest, the highest risk, in, in this in this financial risk in this portfolio. So it, it does need to be in here somewhere. It seems to me, uh, Jeff. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah. For, just following on from that. Um, yeah. One of the concerns I think Simon uh, mentioned it was. I think he said if demand increases, uh, the budget deficit could increase possibly up to 60 million in the future, you yeah, know, which, right. which could completely um, bite yeah. the council. Um, that is actually what Schools Forum have got in their plan. That's 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 not a hypothetical. That's well, it is mm. hypothetical, but it's very much their thinking that that's yeah. the figure it'll climb to in three years. Yeah, and they've taken okay. on what eight, 80 new frontline staff. So, uh, you know. Um, you know, there, there has to be a result of that. Uh, yeah, but that's not to do with Heidi's funding, Jeff. Just to, just to make quite sure, those are two different things. No, the 80 new, new frontline start was for EHCPs, was it? Yeah, that's EHCPs and supporting, yeah, the people that, 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 that need services. This is about funding in schools and uh, oh, okay. funding for special okay. schools. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so, so we seem to be the, the the conversation seems to to be broadly in three three themes. One, one is around um, send, po possibly savings, but EACPs as part of the as as part of that would be uh, is is an important question. High needs funding and and the and the risk the financial risk to the authority, and then yeah, youth fine. services youth services particularly around youth clubs has been mentioned. And, and about how how they can be provided uh, in the future, possibly outside of an education setting. Is that a reasonable sort of summary? Is that is that something you could work with Natalie in terms of putting uh, putting some recommendations together for us? John, yeah, can absolutely. Can I just slightly adjust that last one a little oh, bit? Please. I absolutely understand what uh, the comment about what Michael and, and Jeff was saying about the uh, uh, the physical aspect, but I think the service provision across the county could be severely at risk because they're having to close these down and they're, yeah. and they're not they're looking for alternative provision places but they don't seem to have them so i think there's an element of that as well uh, i don't know if we can build that in actually something that just says let's hope you know they need to be able to make sure that people up in buntingford you know don't have to go 20 miles to get the service they need because the local use are disclosed which is what they were proposing they were saying you know they're looking at uh, other facilities within the district. I mean, you know, that could be users in Buntingford having to travel to, say, Bishop Stortford, you know, which is uh, yeah. it, it, which is out of the question, really. OK, OK, thank you. Um, David, did you have your hand up? Yes. Yes, I did. Thank you. Just on this youth club one, and I know, and I know it's something we will take a great deal of interest in, but uh, uh, my recollection is that a lot of the changes were necessary because of much of the facilities were uh, time expired, um, uh, overly complex and expensive to run or modernise, uh, and in many cases underutilised. So I just urge caution there. Um, it might be that you would want to put a note on it asking for some more information to come forward because you've expressed an interest, but I'm not sure that we could necessarily 
extract good value from from a, a full on recommendation. But I'll, I'll leave that with you. OK, thank you. OK, are there any other comments? I mean, uh, Natalie, are we expected to actually tie down specific recommendations today? Or is it just really things that you would then go away and, and work with? No, what I'll do, what I'll do is I'll um, redraft the recommendations, give you a third. Um, it'll come out to, to you tonight and then we're, we're looking for a turnaround by Friday lunchtime. So hopefully you'll have enough time to have a look at that. And um, obviously the chair, John, you're, you're driving that process. OK, fine. Thank you. OK, are you happy that we've done what we need to, to do? It looks like it. That, that, that's the case, John. And, and my thanks to you. You've, you've done a superb okay. job for us, as ever. Oh, um, right, and, and thanks to the members, because uh, we need now to move through into yeah. the recommendations for the children, young people and families. So I'm hoping that Richard's there. I am. In, in, I the, am. Dark, in the darkness. In the dark. Yeah, my camera's still not working. I rebooted and I'm still not available. <coughs> Never mind. We'll have to start right. calling you Welling. Have to start calling you Wellington. <laughs> yes, well, there you go. Uh, a close run thing. Right. Um, who's picking this one up for me, uh, please, David? Natalie or Joanna? Joanna yes, please. The, vo the volume is very low. Can you hear me? Can everyone hear me? Yeah, we've got yeah. you now. Yep, all good. OK, uh, so we had a number of discussions today, um, heard of numerous challenges facing uh, children's services, such as increased complexity of need, uh, a, a shorter shortage of provider placements and the additional in, uh, pressures of in, inflation. Um, we heard about how the independent uh, placement market has increased significantly and that there is therefore a need uh, for a mixed approach uh, between kind of independent placements and foster care and that um, the service has been trialling a specialised foster care pilot to kind of reduce that mat demand on independent placements. Um, then a further discussion around increased support for complex uh, presentations with the SASH team working closely with partners such as the police to provide that really intense support uh, the, of young people who are exposed to risks such as county lines. Um, and then some really positive things around uh, Cherry Tree Cottage, which is that what we uh, discussed earlier, that mixed uh, economy of commissioning of in-house um, beds uh, to meet have a tailored um, approach to meet those complex needs of, of children in care uh, and that's been a, a joint piece of work with ment um, with public health uh, and looking at um, children or young people who've been discharged from uh, due to mental health and making sure that they have that tailored provision. Uh, and then we also heard about the learnings that have been taken from phase one of the uh, strategy, residential strategy and what barriers um, came across at the time, things like factors such as uh, getting planning permission and recruitment of experienced staff. So just mindful of time and therefore on that note we're going to now share um, the proposed emerging recommendations. Mm -hmm. Thanks Joanna, Can, any chance you could increase the size? Yeah, of that yeah I'm just, just... Some of us at 81 are having uh, to use magnifying glasses. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then just plus, plus, yeah, mm -hmm. brilliant. It's going to do it for a slideshow. Okay, uh, yes, so um, the first one's around independent placements, because I know that was discussed quite widely, and that the cost of those and the impact of democratic pre uh, pressures of revenue savings is taken to, taken to panel. The second one is around that kind of retainment and recruition, uh, uh, retention of uh, the workforce. So providing tailored training and career opportunities and support the emotional well-being of staff to really to grow that in-house provision of our, our workforce that was discussed. And then again, around that kind of increasing need and complexity of children and young people that the cabinet member is encouraged to consider a phase three to the residential strategy to consider that 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 increasing demand and, and need and to assess that and, value, and evaluate that. 
And then finally, to review the recruitment and retention strategy of highly skilled foster carers to achieve the required ambitious savings targets. Over to you, Chair. Thank you very much. Excuse me, I keep pressing the button. Uh, Steve Jarvis. Uh, thanks. I, I think the the last three of those all look fine. I'm not entirely clear what the first one is going to deliver. And I think the other question that occurred to me, you know, we, we debated the, the fact that the um, that the increased cost of, of looked after children's placements is, is a real issue that the residential strategy is intended to address. Um, but what I think is we need, I think there ought to be a recommendation about in about monitoring the progress of that uh, and ensuring that it does actually deliver not just the the, the childcare benefits, which which are significant, but also delivers the the financial benefits, which the IP assumes. Because I think that's really important. You know, otherwise the the looked after children's costs are are going to vastly exceed what's in the IP. So I think there needs to be some sort of monitoring and contingency recommendation in there relating to those actions. Um, in fact, not just about the the um, the residential strategy, but also about the work that's been done in foster carers with foster carers. Thanks, Steve. Um, yeah, I think that makes absolute sense. But in terms of um, a recommendation, one wonders how succinct we need to be. Clearly, ongoing monitoring. If there isn't ongoing monitoring, the the entire process could just fall apart, and it would be pretty pretty useless. Um, can somebody please comment, uh, possibly Joanna or, or, or Natalie, about how we can strengthen that without constraining? Uh, the capacity of of of, of the uh, directorate to carry out its works. Just rewording the first one. Sorry, uh, mm -hmm. Richard. Just to confirm, is that the the rewording of the first uh, recommendation? Yes. Yes. I think I yes. think so. Yes. yes. I think yes. So. Mm -hmm. So we can take on board absolutely about the regards to the monitoring and of the progress to deliver those financial benefits and also that care provision to um to match that the need. What I'm proposing then is, is, is if you can draft a, 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 a rewording to incorporate Steve's concerns in this yeah. uh, and then circulate it to the, the panel members uh, and, and we'll sign it off before the, 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 the due date on Friday. Absolutely. So the intention is to um, send out a draft uh, recommendations to the group, to yourself, Chair, uh, and then by close of pay today for them to have uh, comments back as well. For the group. Yeah, yeah. And, and can you, uh, group, can I, can I ask if you can coordinate those, copy in, obviously copy in officers, but uh, do it through me and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll sort of put it all together and make sure we sign it off before Friday. Absolutely. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. Happy with that. I don't see any other hands up, so I, I'm, I'm taking it that uh, with I'm that alteration. With that. Oh, sorry. Beg your pardon, Nigel. Beg your pardon. No, sorry. No, I'm just saying I'm content with that and with what you've got on there, and we'll follow up at panel the other points. But I'm content with what we've got on there. Yeah, fine. Bless you all. Well, thank you very much. In which case, Joanna, uh, Natalie, uh, Jaiman, can I just thank all the support officers that I've had? Uh, there was a, a, a small yeah, yeah. problem, a small problem that went out. I don't know why some members um, clearly didn't receive the communications that were sent. I have no idea why, nor have any idea why my blessed machine is um, not showing my fizzog. But oh, I have to say to you, I am delighted. Uh, the conduct of that meeting was brilliant. The questions were pertinent. The responses were absolutely to the point. I think we've achieved what we set out to achieve, and I'm grateful to you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. As, uh, Thank you. as indeed am I, because uh, working with the with the officer team, f f who have my 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 huge thanks. The temperature in this room in Mission Control in County Hall <laughs> has risen about 20 <laughs> degrees during the course of the day with the the emanations <laughs> and the brain power. But it's been truly uh, truly interesting. This this has been reworked. Um, from last year and over the years, we've we've always strived to improve the process uh, and, in, and and get more benefit from it. 
and this has been reworked with a view to going into uh, perhaps next year's session with with you know single-handedly effectively because we've had the benefit of as you can see Natalie and Joanna this time and we're uh, sadly we're going to lose Joanna I'm April as she goes off to other other another role within the council and we're mm -hmm. reduced to one officer so this was uh, this was an opportunity to uh, practice a, a, a run through and I have to say today has run exactly at the time uh, entirely due to the hard work that members uh, and our and, and your scrutiny support officers have put into it so yeah. thank you so much um, yeah, yeah. some yeah. of some of us yeah. are back here on uh, portfolios and then again of course the overview and scrutiny committee will be meeting on on Friday the 2nd for the formal ratification so huge thanks to everybody involved particular thanks from me to, to Natalie and Joanna um, uh, whose work today has yet to finish uh, but they will at least be doing it um, with, without you us all looking at them okay many thanks David Thank before you, you go well just, just just 